for coming. Uh, Breno, can you see? Can you see my screen sharing? Yep, we see it uh, perfect size in uh, landscape. Okay, great. Because I can I cannot see what I'm sharing. So um, in the video, you can put the the shared screen with the video side by side. I will appear in a moment. Um, I'm basically sharing the the video of my uh, real time lab DHS two lab for the for the demonstration. And I'm not able to switch my camera, so I'm right here. Good morning. So I'll start with the what we call the reporting mode um, demo. So what you see is uh, DHIS2 on the mobile device, as mentioned. And as you picked up, we are developing primarily for mobile devices because that is sustainable. And um, you can see these are the flagship applications we were asking about. Uh, this morning, and you can see two of them, monthly stock report data recording, and then there's also one uh, with calculations that I will not show today, but just for you to know that you can also make calculations. And please jump in with any questions that uh, come up. Uh, don't keep them to the end, and Brenner will also make comments and maybe ask some questions because there's a lot of details that I might not uh, pick up. So very simple. This is my pharmacy. I have my medicines here that you can see very orderly. All of them are labeled, also with barcodes that will show for the um, real-time mode. And now let's assume it's the end of September. Uh, and today I'm the storekeeper and I'm supposed to carry out my monthly stock count as we all do every month. So I'm going to select the monthly stock uh, report uh, and um, it will bring up all the months, so you can see the months that I have made uh, recordings uh, before. So you see that I have not counted, let's say I'm counting for September. It's a bit late, but um, my pharmacy was just open. So I'm going to first select the organization unit. You have a lot free here, but this is just a, because I have admin rights. Normally, if you're the storekeeper from my household, you will have only the option from my household. You will not be able to edit any other pharmacy. And I'm going to now do, uh, fill in my stock uh, report for September, go to next, and it will bring me up a list of all my items. So what you can see here is we have tabs. So these are optional. You can also have a complete list of all your items. The reason we have done that is because you might have a long list of 100 and up to 300 items, and you will have to scroll down to a list. The other issue is that in DHIS2 natively, you can, you all the items are sorted alphabetically. And as a storekeeper, you don't want to mix the dressing material, x-ray and lab material with your medicine. So you, this is a possibility of selecting them into different groups. So here we have, let's say a, a group for the oral drugs and for the injectable drugs, but you could also have groups then for your dressing material and your lab items. So let's go to the oral drugs because my pharmacy doesn't uh, provide any injectable drugs. And you see, you have a very simple table. I have a list of all my items here on the left side, and you have a, a list of columns um, for the data that we are going to collect. So in this case, um, you have the, the, the classical columns, uh, the stock distributed, redistributed, discarded if it expires, record your stock on hand and you can make a stock correction, right? So uh, we have only one hour today. So I'll basically only show you the, the short version. And that is how to collect the stock on hand. Uh, the stock distributed and the other details you will have to basically still collect it from your, from your stock card or your batch card. So for the stock on hand, um, I'm checking, so I have cloxacilin. That's the first one I'm going to count. So I'll just click on my screen. This is my cloxacilin, and I have 5,000 tablets on the shelf. So I have counted. It's a little pharmacy, so not much to. Uh, I, okay. Um, sorry, I just overlooked something for those who are DHIS2 experts. It's because. I cannot on the 11th <clears throat> on the 11th of October. I'm not allowed to make uh, enter report for retrospectively for September. There's a user setting. Um, so let me check. 
Yeah, I should know that. Okay. So I start again. Uh, I'm entering for October. Um, so in the implementations that we have done uh, so far, you can enter your stand until the fifth day of the next month. So until the fifth of October, I can enter the stock in September because you don't want the storekeepers to enter data retrospectively for July, August. But that's a setting that you can control. So now I have access. Um, counting my clocks, Celine, that's easy to do. Uh, I don't know if the uh, webcam is large. Um, um, so I have five cans, so I put 5,000. So very simple. And then folic acid. So for the folic acid, I have a tray. I again have uh, 500. And I have a box, uh, unopened box of 10 cans. So in total, I have 1,500. So I'm going to enter 1,500. So let's count another one. We have some paracetamol here. And here I have 7,000 paracetamol. And I have another 10,000. So this is a system that's proved to be really useful so that you don't have to count hundreds of cans. You just have the loose cans in the tray and all the other ones you have in boxes and you can mark them. This is coming from the supplier, so I'm sure that there are 10,000 inside. And then I have my salbutamol. That's the last item I'm going to count. So I have six salbutamol inhalers here, and I have a box of another 10. So in total, I have 16. And that basically completes my recording. Now for the stock distributed, I don't, I haven't set up my stock cards yet. So I'm just launching the pharmacy today. So I'm just going to invent something. So just for the sake of demonstration, so I'm going to enter the stock distributed. Let's say we distributed 4,000 paracetamol and I distributed two uh, salbutamol puff inhalers during the month of September. So that basically completes my stock entry. So you could still um, record the stock received. We don't recommend it. We have just added it because it's still often done but as shown yesterday by Pierre if you're integrated with an upstream system the stock received will be recorded in Medexis or M supplier or another system so need, no need to bother the storekeeper to enter the second time and then the stock distributed if you give it to another facility so that it's not considered in your consumption and then of course if you have stock that is damaged or is expired or is recalled then you uh, recorded the stock discarded and eventually, if you find the discrepancy of your stocks, so there's a difference between uh, what you have on the shelf and what you should have according to the calculations, you can make a stock correction. So that's basically all there is. We keep it as simple as possible. There's a single screen, so it's easy to train um, staff because it uh, doesn't require a lengthy briefing process. In fact, we have launched the system in Somalia in uh, almost 30 facilities and it took one hour to set up every storekeeper, to brief them, and to uh, train them on how to use the system. So I'm just going to save it. Um, that's all there is to do. So not more than that. Um, the data is now entered and available on. So I would have to synchronize, important. Um, uh, you can set up an automatic like daily synchronization, but in this case, I'm going to synchronize my data. So you can might be able to see I synchronized yesterday afternoon. So I'm going to synchronize my data so that it's not only saved on a local device, but it's also on the server. As mentioned, you can also use the system offline, uh, enter all your data. And once uh, you have a network connection, then you can uh, synchronize your data. So you could even if you have, if you don't have an internet connection for several days, you still can still collect your data. Okay, is you have any questions or comments on this so far? George, do you mind if I just make a couple of comments and then you confirm? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so absolutely. first you, you have a prerequisite that your stores should be properly organized with a generic labeling of each medicine. So if you have your paracetamol 500 milligram, you should have a generic barcoding to identify that item at a generic level. And secondly, that you also have the stock management using stock cards and bin cards in the same way to issue and receive. And then you're using this to report digitally e each month. On those two points, is that right? Uh, just to mention, so the barcode is only for the real-time system that it will demo now. So for the reporting mode for 
just for entering for counting you don't need the bar of course every every pharmacy should have proper labeling so that you can uniquely identify the items right so a unique identifier and then another point is that uh, the data entry form, it can be configured both with the uh, the tabular form to split the, the items and also with the different items that are there. This is entirely configurable according to the number of items and which items that you have available in your store, be it you know 10 or 20 items or over hundreds of items. This can be entirely configured according to the requirements. Yes, absolutely correct. Uh, the system that we're using in Somalia actually have a long list but we use the item codes then for, for sorting the items. You can see some item codes here that are not displayed on the screen. So DHIS2 is very versatile. There's different ways um, uh, of setting this up. Uh, natively, all the, all the columns are sorting alphabetically, but there is a, a feature called grouping that allows you to actually arrange the items in a distinct order. So that's also possible. Okay, and then a last general comment that we're looking at this as a solution for where paper based management is being used paper reporting moving to a district and to a higher level. And that by having then the reporting digitized you're making the data more readily available and then being used also for forecasting and demand planning, rather than waiting. You know days or weeks or even months for that data to be made available and complete. Uh, for that to be done. So this is feeding into a larger process, and it's also looking at a move from paper-based management to digital reporting. Uh, just to say that this is, in, this, in essence, a first step towards digitizing facilities and using a digital tool to replace a paper reporting uh, workflow. All right, back to you, George, if you have any comments or if you want to continue then. Yeah. Um, um... I think I mentioned so offline, uh, online, I'm just checking my notes. Uh, our recommendation is to keep it as simple as possible. So uh, you can see that there are several columns, in fact, with the, um, the implementation uh, with the Red Cross that we presented at the annual conference. We are collecting only the stock on hand and the stock distributed, nothing else to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and um, yes, uh, just to mention that it is also possible to make simple calculations. You can look at that in the, in the, in the sandbox. Maybe I will not show it now. Um, we discourage the calculations in general. We think it's better to do them in the upstream system. But if you want just to uh, calculate your coverage time or your stock balance, it is perfectly possible. Um, maybe I should. I'll change my screen and I'll show you the, the dashboard now for the basic mode. Before I go to the demo of the, uh, sorry, the reporting mode, before I go to the demo of the real time mode. Okay, I'm going to just need to share my right screen. Start screen sharing. Okay. Okay, I'm sharing. Ben, if you can please confirm if you can see the DHS2 dashboard. Yeah, we see it clearly, George. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is a monthly, this is like a dashboard that gives you some examples of what can be done now just from the data that you have just seen. Um, this is actually from the advanced mode, so you can see um, this is the first table is basically all the data that you're collecting on the tablet, um, but you can view several months on the same table. That's the only difference, but you can have all the data. And this is really useful because uh, maybe what you have seen doesn't uh, look very spectacular, but it is uh, because you can share the data uh, in real time. So keep in mind, uh, the storekeeper already has this data on their local database in DHS2, but uh, anybody at the district, at the regional, at the national level um, can also view all that data uh, on directly in DHS2. So here, this is a, a simple way if you want to calculate your stock discrepancy. So if you have the automatic calculation and the actual stock count, uh, we're not going to details now. The number of stock outs in a facility over a month. So this is a very useful um, indicators so you can see 
how many items at the end of the month were out of stock. And then um, also very frequently um, calculated uh, metric is a stock, stock coverage time. So you can see the each item by month um, from these six items and whether they are out of stock, under stock, overstock or excessive stock with a color coding. So very easy to see whether your stock is well balanced. And then this one is a bit of more technical um, chart. If you're not familiar with it, you can count the number of items and the coverage time. And basically you should have a peak in the middle. So you see my stock is very badly bal balanced because I have either shortages or total overstock. So that's in a nutshell, just to show you that there are some possibilities uh, for some simple visualizations. But again, the recommendation is to keep it, um, to keep as many calculations as possible to the, to the upstream system, because in all of these uh, calculations are native in, in, in uh, ELMIS system and DHS2 is not really made for this kind of calculations. So if there's no, if there aren't any questions, I uh, will move on to the real time mode. No questions, Preno? Okay. There, George, just one uh, stock Go update. Ahead. Stock out days was not included in the data entry form. That can be configured, yes. if, but why not? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the stock out days is commonly collected. Um, I think it's cumbersome to uh, to collect the data because you basically have to um, calculate it manually from a stock uh, from a stock card. But of course, if that's uh, what is currently being used, if that is a national protocols, then uh, perfectly correct. It's very common that in the data collection um, you will have a, add a column um, to record the stock out days. Okay, I need to refresh my thing. I need to refresh my browser. Okay, any other comments? How do you so get the calculation? Not... How do you get the calculation from the upstream system? You mentioned that this should be done in the upstream ELMIS. Yeah. So what we are exploring with uh, with Medexis is that um, um, in Medexis, for example, in Mali, you can configure different reports. Um, which are based on the data from Medexis and or the data from THIS2. And then you could have like a, a weekly report, a monthly report that is visible um, in, in THIS2 in the, in the notifications. There's also possibility of pushing uh, data. So you could also have a calculation, for example, the stock received instead of recording it. Uh, I think we were actually doing that in Mali instead of the storekeeper recording the stock received. Uh, the stock received is anyway um, updated in Medexis and it is then pushed to DHIS2 so the storekeeper has visibility of what was delivered. Great, thank you, George. Hi, hi dear. I, I have a question about uh, why, why we need to uh, calculate uh, the, the stock on hand every month, why we are not using the transaction of uh, like uh, calculated uh, automatic by uh, receive an out, in and out from stock. Yeah, thank you. I'm coming to that in a minute. So we offer both modes. So what I have showed is the reporting mode. That's the, the simple way, um, basically replacing the, the paper records with, uh, with a mobile device. Uh, I fully agree that eventually we hope that the real-time uh, mode that I would just demonstrate, you know, will uh, uh, the use will in increase. Uh, but there's different reasons to offer it. Um, as um, it's a big step to go from paper to the real-time mode, and uh, the real-time mode, uh, as I will show in a minute. It takes some preparation. You have to have barcodes. You have to have uh, trained staff. You also need a good internet connection. So it's uh, it's not very difficult, but it's not as easy as setting up the basic mode. Uh, so our recommendation for the implementation is uh, to start with the reporting mode. 
um, to make sure that all the store key, all the facilities first have tablets. I think that is maybe the biggest challenge that all the storekeepers are familiar with using mobile devices. Uh, that's also not a given. Uh, some places, some countries, mobile devices are uh, used everywhere and other places, staff are not that familiar. Um, and once you have basically digitized your, your first data mile, then you can basically consider transiting to the, uh, the real-time mode. Okay, Brenner, do we have any other questions? I think that's good. We can continue. Okay. Your replies I'm also capturing and sharing in the uh, in the Slack channel. So go ahead with the demo, George. Okay. So I'll I'll stop sharing and reshare my other screen. Okay. So we can confirm that you can see the real time mode up right now. Yeah, we see I it. I think uh, that's as large as. Yeah. yeah. Full, full okay, that's as large as it gets. Go ahead. We see it in full format, go ahead. Okay, great. So that's as large as it get. If I maximize it, it will cut off on the side. So you will see the space on the empty. So this is, can't say it's a prototype. This is a fully functional version of uh, the real-time mode. So exactly as was just mentioned, why not record the transactions? That's the right question to, to ask. Uh, so this is the system that we presented during the annual conference in Oslo that has been developed by our systems, implemented by the, by the Red Cross. And that is now also available in the sandbox. So you can connect, you can uh, install the APK file and connect to the sandbox and explore it yourself. And uh, this is the basis for, the, for what is being developed by the University of Oslo, and we have to hope to have a prototype uh, in April next year. So again, we, we keep it very, very simple. I'm sure you will have opinions that you uh, can think of. Uh, if you do, write them in the chat window. We are just uh, working on the development, so we will be happy to include anything that we might have missed. So I spare you the login and um, with the credentials, um, which works as usual. So here you have three possibilities. You can either distribute goods, which is hopefully the most common use case. Distribution means that a storekeeper, uh, a nurse will come uh, once a day, once a week, once a month, depending on how the uh, hospital or the clinic is managed with a list of items, can be a preprinted form or a handwritten form to the pharmacist with a request to prepare those goods for delivery to let's say the operating theater, the outpatient department. And the, the storekeeper, the pharmacist, what they do day in and day out is that they basically go to the shelf, pick the items and prepare them and then deliver them to the ward or somebody comes and picks it up. So this is basically the use case this is made for. Then you have the possibility of discarding. Um, obviously, if you have goods that expired or are damaged, or are unusable for whatever reason, you need to discard them and you don't want to include them in your consumption. And then finally, if you find a discrepancy be between your stock that you have on your shelf and the stock as recorded in the system, then uh, you need to make a correction to reconcile them. So you could have been, there could have been a mistake. So less was delivered or more was delivered than indicated on a packing list or some goods were misplaced or many reasons. So I'm going just going to show the distribution. Um, so you have to select the transactions. I'm selecting distribution. And um, again, if you are the storekeeper with the user rights, the native functionality in DHS2, you can control that. Normally a storekeeper will have access to only a single facility. In that case, you don't even have a drop down menu. The transaction date will default to the day. And now you have a customizable drop down menu where these goods are going to be delivered to. So let's say I have uh, today received a request from the pediatric department um, because in addition uh, to just recording your transactions in and out, you also want to know at the end of the day where you have distributed these goods to because that is also recorded on your stock card. And eventually the system is supposed to replace your stock card, not your batch card, but your stock. So 
that's all I need to do, basically select distribution and where I'm distributing to. Then I'll go and proceed. And now I have three possibilities. I have here, this is a list of uh, all the items that you see in the pharmacy here, these 11 items, and you can see the current position. So I can either make a search for the item. So I could search for uh, paracetamol, for example, and then I will find paracetamol. So I don't need that if I have 11 items, but let's say I have 300 items, um, I could search. But of course that's cumbersome um, to search every time and very time consuming. So the second option I have is to scroll up and down my list and to find that item, but that is also time consuming and it is prone to error because you might find your item on the list, but then you might be typing in the wrong, I might be typing in the penicillin row instead of paracetamol. So the preferred way of using this is to scan the barcode. So I'm going to now, um, for example, pick my uh, albendazole, which is the first item on my shelf. So I'm going to select the barcode scanner and it scanned the barcode. So you can see it says albendazole. And the first benefit is it already shows you how much you have should have in stock. Of course you have that on your stock card also, but now you have it on the screen. So I'll take out the tray. So you can see I actually have 3000 and let's say I'm going to pick 2000, lost the lid. So I'm going to actually take my bin here for the pediatric department and put 2000 in my bin. And so, yeah, I should say I should enter 2000, of course, to record my transaction. And what you can see on the screen is that it's calculating the remaining stock on hand in real time. So you can see you had 3000, you pick 2000, 1000 is left. And this shows you already one of the, the big benefits uh, in principle, you don't need to count your stock at the end of the month. Now you're going to be shocked because we have all been doing that for all our life and you have to count your stock once a month. So if you were never to count your stock, then eventually you will have a lot of discrepancies and you will never find out. So this is a clever system that is called residual batch counting in the textbooks. Very simple. In this case, I have only 1000 left and you don't have to do a lot of counting. You can see 1000 is left, so my stocks are correct. Of course, it doesn't always, it's not always that simple, but every time when you are like finishing your bin and you're opening a new box of 10,000 or 60 or, or 100, you can always do this batch counting and it has a big uh, uh, stock count and it has a big advantage that um, you will, f if there's a mistake, you will detect it immediately because at the end of the month, if you have a discrepancy, very difficult to find out what went wrong. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to uh, select my next item, which is my chlorhexidine, a little bottle. So you can see um, barcodes are not perfect. It happens sometimes. I have to still improve my barcodes, but uh, yeah. No computer systems are perfect. Again, um, I have six chlorhexidine here. So this is actually an empty box that should not be here. I have uh, six bottles and I have a box of 10. So I know that I have 16. And let's say I'm going to take three of those bottles ready for delivery. Again, you can see 16 were there. I take three, that leaves three, uh, 13 plus 10. Residual balance counting. So I'm sure my stock is correct. Uh, might be more difficult in a bigger store, but it still works. Um, you can also have goods on pallets or, okay, I'm going to take my paracetamol. You could also have goods on pallets that are like counted. So paracetamol, I have 10,000 in the box and I have a tray of 17,000. Right, I'm going to take it off so that you can see. And let's say I'm going to take 2000 of those. Okay, so that leaves 15,000. Again, I don't really have to actively count 10,000, 5,000 are left on the tray. 
you can easily see that without really thinking much about it. Okay, let's say I completed my count now. I don't know if you can see my tray. Okay, I have a basket here with, with the goods that I collected, right? So normally what you will do is you will take it to the dispensing place and you're going to review what you have counted. So you can see the basket, but I'm checking. I have 2000 albinosol, three uh, chlorhexidine and uh, 2000 paracetamol. I can still make corrections. I can delete, I can change the numbers. I could add items, but everything is correct. And I'm just going to select confirm. And I can see here, you have a little line all the way on the top of the, <clears throat> um, in the middle of the screen where it says recent activity, you can see pediatric department, 11th of October, 1052, that's my local time. That transaction was complete. It's not giving you the details here. I will show it in the analytics, but you see that the record was uh, recorded. If you have an internet connection, um, you should still uh, synchronize your data so that it's on the server and you have a backup in case the, the tablet is damaged. Any questions so far? Or comments? I think we, you can continue for now. We can take a few questions after. George. Okay. Um, so live demos are a bit risky or very risky, but I'll try it anyway. Uh, might not work. There is one more feature that I have not shown so far. Uh, it's a bit shaky, honestly, but it does work. So you can see I'm going to use a microphone entry. And the idea is that instead of typing the quantities, it would be easier to just dictate the quantities because you would not have to fiddle with the online uh, keyboard. So I'm going to try this for one or two items. Okay. I have not selected a transaction type, so it gave me an error, of course not. So distribution, so let's distribute to the inpatient surgical department this time. Okay, sorry. And I'm still in my household. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll take the, let me see, I'll try the chlorhexidine again. Two. It didn't work. Three. So you see, it didn't. It doesn't work every time. Uh, it needs to be improved. But you can see that in principle it worked. So I didn't have to type three. I just dictated it, and the um, speech to text recognition converted my speech into three and. You can see I had, we had 13, and if I pick three, 10 are left, that is correct. So I'll, I'm going to stretch my luck and try once again <coughs> with, uh, with the cloxacilline. Okay, my barcode, I have, need to improve the lighting. Okay, it's in principle working. 2000. Work perfectly. So I have dictated 2000. I should have shown that I didn't use my hand, but maybe you saw it. And 3000 are left. So I can use the review. And you can see that basically I have entered those two items just by dictating without using the on screen keyboard. Um, so you can use that in the same way. And I will not confirm that transaction because I actually didn't pick it. Okay, I'm hearing some background noise. Okay. So uh, Actually, I'll confirm it. So the, maybe just a short comment on what we're looking on uh, at in the future. So uh, you have seen this is a, this tablet PC is quite convenient because it has a strap in the back and I can just hold it in one hand and move it around. But still uh, we have tested this actually two years ago in, in Aden in Yemen. And if you're a storekeeper and you have to move a tablet up and down uh, all day, this can be quite uh, cumbersome. Also, you have to uh, catch the barcode. 
Fortunately, this application also works very well on a mobile phone. So normally I use my uh, mobile phone, which has a small screen, works perfectly, is much easier. But there are some gadgets that we're thinking of using in, in future. So one of them is this little barcode scanner, right? That you can, it's like, it has the size of a ring. And it has a little button on the side. Here this yellow button, right? And this one um, works like a, like a scanner that you would see in the supermarket. So we're thinking of connecting that. Costs maybe $30. Um, requires a Bluetooth connection that might be fiddly, um, but would basically mean that if you can hold, uh, if you can have the barcode scanner in your hand, in one hand, and you can use the voice recognition, then you have both hands free for picking, you can work because you can still use that hand while you have the barcode scan on your finger. The other option is to use a kind of end, a small endoscope camera, right? So this, is a, this one you could also just strap to your finger and then connect it to a USB. And um, no promises made, but one idea is to use one of these cameras that uh, you can buy like for $30 that have a camera built in the sunglasses. And then basically you would just put on glasses and use the, the camera that is integrated in the glasses for scanning the barcode. So I think that basically concludes the demo. Unless uh, yeah, we have some time for some questions. This is great, George. Uh, we have a question from Robert Moldy who's asking um, if it's possible to have some analytics already in the app so that you don't have to go into the web to actually see the, uh, uh, the data. That's an excellent question. So actually I'm going to show the, so the short answer is that um, the, the current version, the recent version of DHIS2 features the local analytics, which is really a, a fantastic, a great enhancement. Uh, there are some limitations on uh, the visualizations that can be used, but it really works very beautifully. So we have definitely um, plans to integrate the analytics into the, into the future um, DHIS2 application. Uh, it will probably not be available in April, but we are thinking of, we're planning to have a, a second iteration. So hopefully in October next year, you will basically have a little button at the bottom of the screen uh, where you can switch between data entry and uh, analytics, and you can basically view your uh, electronic stock card directly on the screen. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great, George. And then there's another question uh, or perhaps a general comment, but if you can say something also that the monthly reporting of pharmacy is a great feature, but it depends on accurate entry, accurate dispensing to get an accurate report. Okay, that's a very good point. Um, I think it's important to realize that uh, digital systems are not a panacea and um, um, they are, I, we think that there are a big improvement, you can share the data, but at the end of the day, you are always entering, it's always a human entering data and there's no system that will ensure that all the, all the data is correct and mistakes can always be made. So you know, I think there's no, uh, there's no digital system, especially in logistics, that can ensure that all, all the data is correct, right? If you have an item that is missing in a box or if a box is not counted or not scanned, then your data is still going to be wrong. But uh, I fully agree with the comment and uh, it's important to keep in mind that um, digitizing your first data mile and uh, providing tablets and the digital solution is only a small part of the whole uh, process. And definitely if you don't have good processes in place with your storekeepers, if they are not well-trained, uh, you know, um, qualified, motivated, and if the data that is collected is, is not accurate, 
um, then um, it, you will not have the, the correct numbers. That's not certain. All right, I think those are the questions that we received in the chat, George. And I think uh, that this is really great that you demoed this and showed how this works. So both the aggregate stock reporting and then the transaction-based real-time stock tool. I think maybe I can just make a few also summary points and you add something. Uh, just hold on, I still have the analytics to show. Um, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, I'm just, I don't know. Um, okay, let me, I don't know. <clears throat> um, Brandy, if you can run the analytics tables because I'm having problems to access the, the menu. I don't know why. Yeah, and that should in be the meantime, ready, thanks a lot. Okay, so let me share my other screen again. George, while uh, you get actually, ready, just if I can add, because there was one of the previous question that there's no need for you to have the web to see the analytics, it will be uh, built in. So George is, is showing this now, but this will be something that's available within the app. Okay, I don't know. Um... I'm having problems with the with the database. I'm kind of disconnected. I'm not seeing the report that I had opened on the screen that I was kicked out. So I'm trying to connect again. Okay, I don't know, Brian, are you connected to a uh, sandbox dev and could share your screen because you're, you're you logged into the demo account. account. You're logged into the demo okay. account. That's yes, why. thank you. That's why. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Uh, Okay, and of course, I need to um, synchronize my device. I forgot. In the meantime, I will show the line list. Yeah, there. Okay, now I got it. Distribution port. Do you want to just quickly so when show? So, you're still app? seeing my. You're still seeing the line listing, right? Yeah, can you just show where you went to the menu and what the app looks like for those that are new to DHS2? I know that this is a uh, pedantic for those that are familiar, but for those that are new to DHS2 that they see you go into the apps menu and then you have one specific app called line listing. So that's what George is using now. Okay, so what you can see here is basically the digital um, electronic stock card. So you can see here a list of all the transactions that were made. You have here the date, the item code, the item description. So this is, a, uh, yeah. And you have the, the quantity that uh, was distributed and you can see where it was distributed to. So you can also of course have a report then of all the stock that was uh, discarded um, or that uh, the corrections that were made. So you have more of more of reports um, like received. Uh, you can look, view your current stock um, and you can also see the distributions for that were for each uh, world or service. Here's a table with basically the complete tracking of all your stocks. Um, and uh, the stock on hand. So you can see now it the uh, system has refreshed and, uh, but okay, it's, it's only showing the corrections that I made in the morning to prepare for the, for the demonstration. So um, I don't know, I'll try to synchronize again and we might see the, the distributions that were made. So in the meantime, any questions on that, um, on the report? Reporting. 
Yeah, I have two more uh, questions coming in, George, and I think this is quite quickly. Yeah, can you hear me, George? Yeah, I can hear you. Yes, please. Yeah. So we have two more questions coming in, and yeah, also analytics related. How can I group the supplies that I want to download from DHIS two for quarterly reporting? Okay, sorry, I'm not really getting the question. Group the items in what sense? Would that be in a monthly in a stock report on the dashboard? So I wonder if this is related to be able to customize a quarterly report with the specific items that uh, they want to see. So this is coming to the design of a specific visualization. So it would be defining which products you want to see with which data, and then having this um, uh, being reported on uh, for a quarterly period. So I think this is something that's possible to be built. We have a next question. Yes. Is it possible to, yeah, go ahead. So you can see here, this is just examples of the visualizations that you could uh, create and it's highly customizable. So you have here months, uh, you could have this by year. I think quarters are also available. It's just a matter of changing the, uh, the period. And um, um, it is possible to, um, yeah, to uh, flexibly configure this, this kind of visualizations and tables in any way that is required. Go ahead, Brenna. Yeah, and then if it's possible to get the metadata for the LMIS forms and this, um, yeah, go ahead for, for that, the metadata for the LMIS forms. Um, I mean, uh, I don't understand LMIS forms. Uh, you mean to export the data generally? Is that, that the question? Sure, and the data entry forms, yeah. I assume it's referring to, right? Yeah. So the, the data, all the data that you have in the system, it can be, um, it can be exported uh, with the import export application, which is native to DHS2. And otherwise it's also accessible through the API endpoints. If you had a reporting system. Yeah, and this is from uh, Jamal Al Jadan, and I can also add that when you go onto the sandbox site, you can export the metadata using the import export tool. I'll confirm if that's available actually for the demo account, but it should be. So you can actually access. You see it there on the left of the screen that George is sharing under the apps import export. You can export all of the metadata in the way that it's configured now. You can also configure this in change to add or remove metadata. One of the aspects, and George has said it here now, is having only the essential data being captured. That's what we're promoting, to have only key data. Uh, but you can, of course, add and change that configuration to add uh, more metadata if needed. And then I have a question, which I think is, is a quick answer. Why are there amounts with negative values? Um, and I think one of the line lists you showed, I'm not, I didn't see that, but this is a demo data. Yeah, very good question. No, it's actually um, it's a very good question. There are negative values. So actually, um, the the way it works is that negative values are uh, prohibited in the uh, in the distribution and the discard module. But of course, when you make a correction, you can have positive and negative values uh, because you could have stock missing on the shelf or you could have too much on your shelf if you have too much on your stealth shelf then you will have to um, uh, create uh, you have to enter negative values in order to uh, adjust your um, your stock so you have seen negative values is possible only in the stock corrected and you can see here that here a stock correction was made um, to adjust the, the stock so it is definitely positive. Uh, it is definitely possible to have uh, negative values for the stock corrected. Correct. Great observation. Right. I think that's it for the questions we have so far, unless there are more coming in here now. Yes, there are. <laughs> All right, so while computing, say the average monthly consumption of a certain commodity, 
The issue of patient numbers, number of patients consuming that com commodity comes into play, especially affecting the stock levels under, over, or normal stock. Do we have some hints on how this can be handled? Also, this helps inform the redistribution process. Can this be held within the DHS2 dashboard or we would have to link to another system? Good question. So um, we have basically, we have prepared for what we what is commonly called triangulation. So for connecting to HMIS data, our recommendation on, on the forecasting, I mean, DHS2 could do some very simple calculation like multiplying your average demand with a certain number, but it's, uh, it would be quite difficult to consider patient numbers. Our recommendation would be to collect the, the patient data also in DHS2 in one of the uh, HMIS uh, packages. I think there's 40 that are available and then provide that data to an upstream LMIS system and do the calculation in that system like we have seen with Medexis or, or M-Supply. Um, but DHIS2, the, the main objective of the, of the facility level stock management tool is just to collect data and to keep track of your stock. Um, but as we explained yesterday, uh, the data model is not really suited. So we don't recommend to try to make any of these more complex calculations. And now, um, does the pharmacy stock management app store the data collected directly in the DHS2 instance? If no, and assuming the app is storing its data someplace else, what was the chosen approach in mapping required commodities metadata from the app to the corresponding attributes or data elements in DHS2? So good question. Uh, we have a, a section on the configuration after the break. Uh, so maybe we can go into the detail. The short answer is that uh, the app is fully built on a native DHIS2 uh, tracker program model. So it is just the user interface that was customized to uh, reduce the number of clicks, but everything behind is just date elements, option sets, tracker program. So it's all native in terms of data model. Right, and that question was from Rajab, and we'll be going into this, as George said, after the break. So we'll, we'll see a bit of how this is done. Um, and then I have two more questions. Actually, they're coming in uh, uh, often here now, George. So we have a question from Abdul Qadir uh, asking, our LMIS monthly report tool is not grouped by programs. If I want to get one program commodity, how can I get that easily? For example, TB or HIV? Good question. So this is very common, actually. Um, so I have shown before you had, uh, uh, you would have different uh, options. So you could either have separate um, data entry forms for each of the programs like TB, HIV, malaria, and just uh, have separate lists which are managed separately. Or you could have, like you, if you remember, you have seen the tabs on the top of the screen for oral injectable drugs. You could also just have separate tabs. So you have different ways of uh, resolving that, but definitely it is possible to um, collect this um, program data separately. Great. And then we have a question from Paul who's asking, is the metadata available for, for the pharmacy stock management for testing? And actually I have a few comments on that before, George, if you want to add something, but um, so this tool is a prototype that we're uh, sharing here now and George is using. It will be integrated into the uh, uh, core for the April, 2023 release. You can test it, but we'll need to make the APK file available to you. So the code is on GitHub, and if you can compile and, and create this, it's fine, but we'll make the file available on the Google Drive, and then you can connect it to the same sandbox server, and you can use the metadata that George has shown. So it's really uh, uh, already configured to that app. Um, it won't be as easily changed as the aggregate, but you can test and do the same different uh, uh, um, uh, demos or, or processes that George showed you here. All right, so that I will share in the resources folder. It's not there yet, but we will make it available. All right. There's a hand raised in, uh, in the Zoom call. I don't know if that question was taken. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, 
Any yes. Uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is about the line listing. Yeah. Um. Uh, when we look at uh, the, the 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 pharmacy, uh, especially where I am in South Sudan, we uh, in some busy hospital. Actually, the hospital, the all the hospital have pharmacy, and then we have also dispensing unit. And then uh, the dispensing unit is where we, you know, consume these drugs. So I don't know uh, uh, for the line listing, uh, uh, what is the actually the real target? Do we only, you know, uh, record this thing at the pharmacy or do we also go down to the dispensing unit you can record this? And then uh, the second question is actually relating to uh, the line listing. Uh, if we, uh, is it going to be a real time, uh, the time you issue out the, 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 the drug to the, to the patient and then this is where you record? Uh, if so, I think, uh, is it possible also maybe to include a few uh, variable on the, on the, on the patient? Because uh, to be for, for accountability uh, purposes, you may find that you may be recording what you have issued twice if we don't have a unique you know, uh, information about the, the person you are issuing this, uh, the, the, the drug. So these are the two questions which I wanted to raise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So my answer is that concerning where uh, exactly where you're using this application, you could use it at the central pharmacy or the point of dispensing or at both points, you would have to look into that, uh, whatever um, you, you want to record. Concerning including patient data, um, so we are not planning to include um, um, patient data. We realize that there's a kind of um, gray area to an electronic medical record system. Um, or we think that uh, you already have um, WHO metadata packages where, for example, the malaria package, where you are including the, uh, the, the, the medicine distribution. So any information, any um, record uh, which uh, considers patient data would basically have to be done in another system. We are not uh, planning to integrate that because that would start to be, become really complicated and, and too complex. This is really intended as a, as, as a tool uh, solely to manage your medical stocks. If you want to go beyond that uh, in terms of recording what drugs were given to what patient, uh, um, rational drug prescription and all of this, you will need to look into uh, an EMR tool or electronic uh, patient registry tool that is also available in DHS too. Are there other questions? Okay, yes, sorry, the second question was uh, whether this will be real time. Yes, the answer is uh, it's planned to be real time. I'm missing one of the items that are distributed. I don't know why, maybe I have to synchronize my tablet again, but in principle, you can see that those items that uh, um, the two items are distributed um, by typing and with the voice recognition to the inpatient pediatric department, those two um, Distributions are available on the server. You just have to synchronize the device, run the analytics table. And yes, we are definitely planning to have this in the local analytics, even if you're offline. We have to see whether that is possible, but eventually we're aiming for that so that whenever you complete a transaction on the, on the mobile device, even if you're off offline, then you will be able to see a complete record um, of all your transactions. I, I have one more, uh, one last important comment. I was just checking actually two, uh, three. Um, my notes, uh, speaking notes. So first of all, um, you will be asking, so if you can record all the distributions, then eventually you're going to receive stock in your pharmacy and you have to update your stock on hand. So what we are uh, planning to do is there will be three possibilities. So first of all, in the native uh, DHS2 app, we plan to have a receipt mode so that you can also manually enter goods if you're not connected to an upstream system. The second option will be to re um, receive your goods 
through the, the bulk uh, load application that is currently available. As mentioned, this is a conventional uh, native tracker program and there's one um, data element for the receipts and you can basically just fill in a number in the web portal and that will add stock. And uh, the third possibility that we are um, ha have implemented with the Red Cross project and we hope to pilot very soon in Somalia and Nigeria is that uh, you have a DHS2 app like we have developed for Mali that when you receive a consignment from the, from the let's say the district store, you will scan a, a, a QR code and uh, confirm the receipt of the consignment. And then all the items and the quantities that are included in that packing list they will be automatically added to your stock um, through an API endpoint. Um, the second comment uh, I wanted to make is the frequent request is to manage patches. So this version is not able to manage the stock at the batch level. We are planning to develop a future version that will allow to, to do that. But we do offer an elegant workaround that we're also testing uh, with the Red Cross in that if you are connected to an upstream system and you have an updated stock on hand um, and you are strictly applying FAFO, then it is possible to deduct the exact quantities, batch numbers and expiry dates of all the batches in the pharmacy from the upstream record without counting anything. And uh, the last comment I, I wanted to make is what is next? Uh, so we are thinking of a future, future version, you know, maybe uh, to be developed in 2024 that will allow the user also to scan GS1 data matrix codes on secondary packaging. And that would allow then a full batch uh, management mode because the GS1 data matrix code includes the, the product number, the serialized number, the batch number, and the expiry date. And then uh, you would have complete management at the batch level, including giving a warning to the storekeeper if they have selected the wrong uh, batch uh, if they are not following FIFA. Yeah, I think that was all my speaking notes uh, I wanted to mention. Are there any other questions, Breno? I think that's great, George. That's a lot of content in a short time. And to remind everybody, we'll go through the configuration after the break. We have six minutes until we take the break. So what we'll do, George, we can maybe uh, do a quick summary. I'll do a quick summary. And we can just, if you have a very important final point to give it there, but we'll try to stop right at 11.30 on the, uh, when the break is planned. The one last question we have here is, and one comment from Paul, Will I be able to migrate from the malaria WHO ELMIS metadata to PSM? So it's great that you've uh, applied and used that configuration for malaria. And if you can migrate that, in principle, it should be possible, but we haven't had this request yet, Paul. So what we'll do is we'll, we can reach out to you and follow up directly to see uh, how that could work. Uh, but uh, in principle, it should be possible. And then we have a comment from uh, Leitzen who says, um, that he would like to think that DHS2 fundamentals, so capture events analysis configuration, comes in handy on the DHS2 LMIS integration. And I replied, and it's uh, uh, true, we're focusing on the LMIS features and the use case, but it's entirely relevant, important, essential to understand DHS2, the landscape, the collaboration with the core team within your, uh, uh, um, your, your country and, and where it's being implemented good connection with the HISP groups that are supporting and are the, the real experts of the software, like I've said. Uh, all of that is essential to, uh, to this. It's not, uh, even though we're only focusing on the LMIS. Now, if I do a quick recap here, and uh, please come with more questions and continue to engage with us. We're very uh, happy to see the, the, the level of engagement and very good questions, I think, throughout. But I'll just quickly do a summary that the focus here and what we're proposing is uh, when we're looking at uh, different levels of uh, uh, tools that are available at this facility level, and oftentimes a paper-based management, which can be fine, it can be well done, and it can be uh, accurate, 
Uh, however, that data is oftentimes not readily available for decision making and for informing central level decisions, particularly forecasting and demand planning, to, to name one example. So we're looking at how do you move from this paper based to a digital, to a report based, to a transactional based, and that you have certain different levels of digital evolution, if you want to call it that. And we're proposing then these two options. So the first option being the report based uh, uh, management where you're still doing your uh, using your stock card to manage the, the quantities that are coming or, or going from stock, the amount that you've issued from stock. And at the end of the month, you make the report through DHS2 and that data is immediately available uh, uh, digitally. So that's kind of a first step and the first option that we proposed. Secondly, it's the transaction base. So it's the real-time stock app that you're managing each transaction from stock. And if you have a daily synchronization with the server, that data is available each day. So you know the stock positions in all of the different sites. All right, so report-based and transaction-based, these are the two options that we propose. Now, where should this be implemented? As George said, it's in the final medical store. We're not uh, capturing the issuance to patients, but rather the last exit or the last issue from the last store in the last mile. And that's what really we're targeting uh, when also we're proposing both this uh, aggregate or transaction-based solution. When it comes to the real-time stock tool, so the transaction-based stock tool, as I said, uh, I'm not sure if I said it or if I wrote it in the, in the chat, but we'll make the, uh, uh, the prototype available. That's what George showed to you here now. And then we'll also, I'll put a link, it's already in my presentation from yesterday, but I'll reshare the link on the uh, mock-up of how this will look once it's integrated in the DHS2 capture app. So in the April 2023 release, so the software release for uh, that's scheduled for April, we'll have this as an integrated uh, uh, feature in that app so that it's native and you'll see how it will actually look. It will not look uh, like what George has shown you here. That, that is really a, a prototype. It's something that was uh, developed for a different organization, but we'll have this integrated as part of the app and it will look and feel and you know function like the, the regular DHS2 app if you're familiar and have used it before. Um, there are questions about reports and analytics. Uh, in, as a general point, that there are um, native uh, analytics features both on web and on the mobile, and you have local analytics, which will allow you to also have them available offline. You can see your line listing, so it will give you your digital stock card when you're using the transaction-based tool. So all that will be built in, and again, it's part of making use of existing features within DHS2. It's not something that we've pushed or had only built for the LMS use case, but it's used for other purposes. And this is just available to you when you use that app. Um, and then some of the other analytics related questions were more based on an actual implementation. So if you have the need for a specific program, a specific metric or indicator uh, for a monthly or quarterly report, a, a specific type of visualization, that should be part of an implementation process where you define the analytics requirements, the analytics uh, products or outputs that you need, and then that should be built there. Uh, we'll have a session with uh, Scott Russ Patrick, who's our analytics uh, product manager, who will really go through uh, the full feature set for DHS2, um, and then we'll be able to see what's possible. But from that, you should choose, okay, this is what's relevant and important uh, and essential for me to have for this user at the central level or, or a, a district or a a facility level that they should be able to see and have this these analytics available. And then the last point on that, and again, connecting it to a few, another session we'll have on performance management. And George will, will present this performance management framework that we also recommend. What data should be available to whom and in which system? Again, one of the replies I gave that it should also be targeted to say, this data should be available to this user for this type of corrective action, that it's not simply showing visualizations for the sake of having them, but that it should be actionable data connected to some uh, activity or some uh, corrective action that will remedy a problem or a situation. All right. Um, and then finally, my last kind of summary point is that for both of these, so both the report-based or the transaction-based option, there is the question of integration they can work on their own and you can collect data and report or manage the transactions. Um, but I think the full value and the value added will really be integrating with a central level tool. It will be 
adding workflows and automating workflows that you would otherwise do manually. And you would also make data available for decision-making like forecasting and demand planning, which I've mentioned multiple times to the central system and central tool, which will improve then the quality of the supply management and health program management. This is really what we're looking for. So you can implement these standalone. They can help. They will digitize uh, the facilities, make data immediately available. You can triangulate data with health data. However, with the integration with either of the options, which is then an additional, again, uh, a step, you'll get even better value with having data available and having this end-to-end -end solution, which we've mentioned multiple times. So that is the summary and just sort of putting this very specific, these very specific features into kind of context, into the greater context. Um, we'll take a break now for 15 minutes and we'll come back and then look at a configuration and how this can be actually implemented. All right. So thank you, everyone. See you back here in 15 minutes. Continue. Yeah, thank you, Simona, for the help. And we'll continue with the um, then configuration of the um, of the two different uh, stock reporting and the transactional based stock management uh, options that we showed today that uh, George demoed. So he'll actually go through uh, some of the configuration uh, aspects of it, and we can discuss the why and why not. So for those of you that are new to DHS2, some of the terminology may be you know, unfamiliar and this is perfectly normal. It takes some time to get into and we'll try to clarify that. So feel free to ask. And here you may have a lot of small questions about you know, what is a data element and indicator and so on. So just ask these freely. Uh, for those of you that have a, a strong DHS2 background, uh, there may be different considerations of why we do it this way and not another way. There are multiple ways we could have chosen. And I think, Originally, there were over 12 different ways we could have configured some of these different uh, stock data, and um, we, we came on this. So if you also have criticisms and reflections, please come with those because we want to clarify why we chose this and why we think this is the best option, keeping in mind usability for the storekeeper, the, the person conducting the data entry, the integration aspect of it, and uh, also analytics. So there's some questions and some things to be explored there. So um, actually, before, George, I hand over to you, I will share the word of the day. Let me know if you can, if you can see that. So the word of the day is actually two words, bubble wrap. Nobody has asked that yet in the, uh, in the channel, but uh, there you have it. So two words, bubble wrap, use that for your attendance. And George will then hand back over to you to continue with the configuration. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Um, so I've changed my, my webcam. Um, I had a short comment on uh, the real-time mode, just to mention that uh, you have seen that you do need barcodes, um, but no worries. So those barcodes can be easily printed natively in, with an Excel file. So I can also provide an Excel file. You can just type any, any kind of code, any text that you're using for a copy paste the list and then just print the, the labels that you have seen with the barcode and the description. It's kind of pre-configured and then attach it. It is uh, some work to do, but it's like one off. Um, so uh, not a big deal. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen. Um, yeah, screen sharing. Okay, um, my screen sharing is disabled. I don't know if there is a it can be activated. Okay. okay, I'm trying again. No, I don't know. Um, is Simona still in the call? Or I don't know. Brenda, do you have uh, present presenters rights? Uh, you should be able no, to. Um, good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I had to reconnect to my to the call. Disabled again. Okay, I'm connected and sharing my screen, my window. Okay. Um, can you see a PowerPoint presentation? 
Yeah, this is perfect, George. Okay. Looking under the okay. hood. Okay. Looking under the hood. So, as Brenna mentioned, um, we have a great variety of participants uh, with different uh, specialities and expertise. Uh, so, some of uh, you, I guess, are much more experienced in THIS2 than myself. Others are quite new. So, it's a bit difficult uh, to address. Uh, anyway, um, also keep in mind that everything that you have seen uh, today and that all the demos that you will see have been actually configured by Brainer and myself. So we do master that with lots of help from uh, numerous people, but we are not DHIS2 experts. So I hope we can answer some questions, but maybe not everything. But again, uh, the HIS groups in the region, those are the rare experts who uh, work on configuration and implementations um, every day, and they will, I'm sure, be able to answer the, all the detailed questions. So very briefly, uh, in a nutshell, maybe uh, I have only this one slide, uh, just to instigate some discussions, um, uh, some questions, um, to basically present very briefly how this is built. So the reporting mode the, with the tabular data entry, it is very simply what is called an aggregate data entry form in DHIS2. Um, it uses category options for the columns. As Brenner has mentioned, we have explored like a dozen different data modules, um, models. And the reason we have chosen the category options, it has nothing to do with, uh, sorry, it's not ideological in any way, it's very simply because, as we have stressed, and you correctly picked up yesterday, we are building all our applications for mobile devices, and happens to be that an aggregate data and for whom is category options is the only way of displaying columns on a mobile device. So custom data entry forms do not render on mobile devices, and there's no plan to make custom data entry uh, forms available on a mobile device. Uh, so that's the only option. Um, the other option would be to have like separate forms for the stock on hand and uh, the, the demand or the consumption that would be kind of cumbersome. It's obvious that you would want to have that in a nice table. Um, and uh, as I presented, you have some standard dashboards, stockouts, coverage time that you can view in the, in the sandbox, maybe just to show something briefly. Uh, concerning simplicity, so the going back to the to the Red Cross project that we presented uh, during the annual conference, they have opted to collect only stock distributed and stock on hand, and to include the impressed level, which is um, the order up to level, which is presented to the storekeepers. They can't edit it, but they can view it. So you see, the this is really according to um, the philosophy of sticking to the essentials and collecting only the data that is absolutely needed. Everything else could be calculated in an upstream system. So this is uh, basically a choice you have for the implementation. And then for the real-time um, stock mode, uh, it is a native tracker program. Um, by the way, so the reporting mode, um, it would take me about one hour to configure this. Somebody from a, with a lot of DHIS2 experience could probably do that in 20, 30 minutes. Um, um, the real-time mode is a tracker program, also takes about maybe one hour to configure end-to-end. -end. The items, so the, the medicines are tracked entity instances, uh, which have to be um, entered separately. Um, so what we are recommending uh, and planning to do is that the real time mode basically has a list of all the transactions that you have seen in the line listing. Now the paradox of the real time mode is that while you have all the transactions and you have the current stock on hand, you might also want to know what was my stock on the 1st of January. Uh, and this you cannot uh, easily have natively in the line listing. So what we are thinking is of combining the tracker and the aggregate using the tracker to aggregate um, by creating monthly snapshots. So you would basically record all your transactions 
um, with the real time app and have them in the line listing. But in addition, automatically running the background once a month, you stock on hand the total aggregate monthly demand and other data you would want to collect will be um, automatically saved on an aggregate data entry form so that you can provide the usual uh, statistics and reports. And also to mention that uh, his center uh, at the University of Oslo is working on a bulk management uh, feature for the tracker program, which will allow to upload um, and edit a large number of tracked entity instances uh, as well as transactions. So this will allow, let's say you could register a long list of items if you started using the real time mode rather than having to register them one by one. And um, as I mentioned, you also need to receive your stocks. So the bulk management is one of the tools that we foresee that if you receive a consignment and you're not integrated with a national ENMS, but you have that data in some shape or form on a CSV file, then you could basically just bulk load it into uh, DHS2 in, in order to update your stock on hand so that you don't have to uh, uh, record e every item one by one, because if you're receiving a full truckload of medicines at the hospital, um, you don't want to have to record each line separately and enter the quantity. And then it's important to mention that for either of these, we don't offer the usual DHS2 packages that you may know from, uh, uh, from uh, HMS, from the WHO packages. One of the main reasons is that the, there's unfortunately no uh, global convention on item descriptions. And if you were to upload a package, it would obviously have to include the, the medicines or the healthcare products that you're managing. And then it would not be very practical to upload a catalog. Let's say what we have, the, what we're using in our live uh, project uh, with the Red Cross, you upload 700 items, but then you have to go and change all the item code, all the, the item descriptions. So this will have to be anyway customized and that's why you need a project. Uh, also, there's quite a big chance that uh, the columns that you're using, the category options will be customized uh, so it's probably, since it takes like half an hour or one hour to configure that, it's probably not worthwhile to upload a package and then to edit, you might um, create it from scratch. But we have the detailed configuration in the in a PDF file uh, that is linked to our website and you can see exactly how this is configured and you can easily customize it. So that's my notes and now I will uh, stop sharing my screen and change to back to DHIS2 and either take questions or if there's no questions, just run through quickly the, the screens in DHIS2, how the configuration was made. Uh, George, I'm there is a quick the question. Chat window, so in case you have any George, do you hear me? Questions. I can hear you, yes, please. Yeah, there is a question uh, kind of going back to the line listing app uh, used in um, uh, together with the real-time stock uh, uh, tool from Tara Richards. Can you just expand on this? So just if you can recap how the line listing connects to the transaction uh, uh, mode. Okay, let me open it. Keep the window. Okay, I'm going to go back to the line listing and open the distribution report. Okay, so the line, I'm not sure I understand the question correctly, but the line listing is basically simply a record and representation of all the transactions um, that were made uh, using the app. So you can see here um, that this morning, um, okay, the, the, yeah, I distributed those two items once with a keyboard and once with a voice recognition. So those 2000 cloxacilline and the three bottles of chlorhexidine, they were um, 
that was the transaction. They were distributed, uh, distributed to the pediatric and the inpatient ward, and that is basically reflected. And then you can create uh, various reports. So one for the distribution, one for expiry, um, for the discards, one for the corrections. And you can have also report by department that the deliveries were made to. But I'm not sure that actually answers the question. Yeah, we can confirm if Tara, uh, just comment if this is uh, not clear, if there's something else you had in mind. But in principle, George, this is replacing your physical stock card. So with the uh, report based, you're still capturing, uh, you know, on paper, the transactions and you report at the end of the month, whereas here, each transaction is managed by the app. So if you want to see what's been done, you would go here and see the specific transactions, as George said, right? So that's the, uh, uh, in a nutshell, but let us know if there's something more. Okay, are there any other questions? That's it. And she confirms that this is clear. So uh, we can continue, George. Okay, so let me see, we have... So I'm going to I'm going to start with the reporting mode, and then uh, this is just to prompt questions because I don't want to go through the whole configuration in detail. That might be uh, um, too boring. But if you have any questions, let me know. So um, back to the reporting mode. Basically, also for those who are not so familiar with uh, THS2 on the web. This is the THS2 web portal. Again, you can see the, the data recordings or the, the simple data collection form that uh, we used the, that was used this morning. Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, you have the you have the items, you have the tabs. As I mentioned, that is optional. Otherwise, you could have a list of all the items, but you can group them in different ways. So we also had a variation. It's not it's not in this database where you could have tabs one for HIV, TB, malaria. Uh, so for the diff, for the different uh, programs, depending on 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 the use case. So this is the way um, the the screen looks for the data entry. Then the way it is configured is basically there's just a data set. So very simple. So this is like. Uh, basics of THS2. So you create um, a data set, you give it a name, uh, something meaningful, so like a monthly stock report. As I mentioned, you can indicate how many days you can, uh, after the end of the month, you can still enter data. As I mentioned, I failed because I wanted to enter data for September, but on the 11th of October, uh, I could have entered data only up to the 5th. So this is a great uh, native tool because that way you prevent um, inadvertent entries in previous months, but still, if the end of the month is a weekend or a holiday, you still allow for two, a few days for completing the, the stock record. Otherwise you have different uh, configurations. As you can see here, render sections is tab. That's exactly the feature that gives you the tabs and then you just add the add or remove the items. So this is really highly flexible. Um, if you want to add, let's say the medical form, you just select it and move it and it will be added to the data set. I will not uh, save it now. So you can see that this data entry form now contains uh, 51 items and the catalog contains uh, in total 722 items. And then you can, uh, uh, yeah, maybe this is an important point. So you can create a, a data set that applies by default to any facility um, for any program, or you could have, I'm going to cancel this now because I don't want to save the change. You could also have um, dedicated um, data entry form just for the HIV program or just for the TB program to do that separately. And um, you could also have a customized data entry form for each of the facilities. Um, so that's easily configurable. So that's uh, what is used for the Red Cross implementation. But keep in mind that if you have hundreds or maybe thousands of facilities and you have customized stock item lists for each of those facilities, this is going to be a lot of work to maintain them. 
So if you can, if it's possible to have like a default list uh, for um, uh, malaria or TB program, then that is probably preferable because you don't you don't have that much uh, work in terms of maintenance. And then finally, to come back to these uh, categories. So uh, for those who are familiar, you have basically, you have the different category options, uh, which you create one of, very simple to do. You have the stock on hand and the stock distributed, for example, those are the main ones. And then from those you create a category by adding, you can see these are basically all the columns, stock received, distributed, redistributed, in the order that appear on the screen in the in the data entry form on in the web portal as well as on the mobile device, uh, and you can easily add or remove them, and then just save. So this is straightforward, and then the category combination is needed. That's a technicality in that case because we have only one level of of uh, categories and you just create the data collection form with the same uh, category option uh, to create the category combination. And then DHS2 in the background is going to automatically create the category option combination. And that completes your, your data set configuration. Yeah, maybe I can show us on the data set because that was this question on the grouping. So let me go here, manage sections. So you can see what I have done here is in order to have these tabs with the items. And again, within every tab, the items, uh, stock items are listed in alphabetical order. Uh, all you need to do is to create the, what is called the group, very easy to do. And let's say I have this group of the oral drugs and here you can um, customize exactly which items are appearing on the list. And um, as I mentioned, um, natively without groups, the items are always sorted in alphabetical order, but here you can actually change the position. So you're not, if for some reason uh, you want the items not to be in alphabetical order, you can do that. And uh, in reference to an earlier question, so instead of having groups like oral drugs, injectable drugs, so this is based on the convention that is used by uh, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross has adopted. Um, but you could have, likewise, you could just have a group called Malaria HIV TB and you can easily create another group, uh, remove a group, you can uh, open a group and uh, just edit and then add remove items. Uh, I mean, you, you cannot uh, add one item to two groups, but if you remove an item from one group, you can move it to add it to another group. So very flexible to cust and uh, versatile to customize to your needs. So I think that uh, unless uh, you have questions, or Brenu, you can think of anything else that we should mention for the for the reporting mode. I think that concludes. What's uh, in the good? Are we not going? Go ahead. Sure. In essence, yes, I think you went through quite well. Again, for those that are DHS2 conversant, this might be uh, just uh, rehashing what you already know. However, there's clear reasons why we chose to do it this way. And for those that are new to DHS2, a lot of the terminology and running through the maintenance app. So the maintenance app is where the configuration is done for these different uh, uh, the data elements, the data sets, and so on. So that's the tool that George was using, if you see it there in the top right in the uh, apps menu. Um, so this is something that the terminology may be new, but you understand what logistics data you want to see, and this is how you're, you're represented. Now, just one or two things that I think we really need to um, solidify, George, is, for example, you mentioned it, I know, but I, I just want to repeat it, that the custom data entry forms one thing we've seen and heard in multiple situations is the desire to have the data entry form look just like the paper form. We've been using this paper form for years. It looks a certain way. It has a certain you know, uh, uh, um, way that it's, it's configured. And we can reproduce that using a custom data entry form. And that can only be used on the web version. The reason why we discourage that, we do not recommend it, is that it cannot be rendered on the mobile device. And there's no plan for that to be done. 
secondly, it's also oftentimes a very large form with lots of data, uh, lots of metadata, lots of information within one single uh, uh, form. And what we're looking to do is to simplify the workflow for this end user, oftentimes not a dedicated storekeeper that's also issuing stocks. This person may need to be treating patients and doing other tasks that are maybe uh, that, that are higher priority. So we're looking to have essential data that can be easily input and used by a user already with access to the app. So that's why we're looking at using standard data entry forms, not custom, and that this is part of the uh, ability to develop towards that. If you're not already using a mobile device, you're using a PC, you can say, sure, we can use custom data entry forms. That can be the case. However, you're somewhat limiting the development path for moving to mobile within one year or two years when that time comes, when there's the possibility to use a mobile device to extend to different sites and lower resource sites, then that option is a bit uh, broken. So I really wanted to uh, um, confirm that and, and, and reaffirm that. And if there's somebody who's already using and implemented DHS2 and has a question around custom data entry forms, please let us know. But uh, that's, I think, one key point for uh, this choice. For the others, I won't get into using data elements um, and category options rather than using uh, individual data elements for all of the, the stock data. If somebody has a question related to that, somebody with a DHS2 background, we can maybe take that up. But I, I don't want to digress too much. We can maybe continue, George, on the... Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for, for mentioning the, the custom data entry form issue. Um, I realize, I mean, Brenda and myself, we have been working on a, quite a few implementations and it can be quite difficult. So people are used to the certain layout of the form and it might also be a national policy to use certain reporting forms. And this is a requirement that cannot be easily changed. Uh, this can be quite a challenge. So this is maybe also an answer. Why don't you go to the real time mode right away is um, this is a big step. So even, you know, implementing, changing the reporting modes slightly can be a challenge. Uh, my advice, uh, I know it's easy said, would be to generally uh, to think of how to simplify the forms. We have also made the observation time and time again that uh, you have huge data entry forms, and I'm always wondering from the perspective of a medical logistician who has spent 25 years of his life in medical warehouses and in hospital and clinic pharmacies, is those poor storekeepers that are requested to enter all those data. So rather than thinking of how can you translate your reporting form one to one, would be to think how can you simplify it um, DHIS2, of course, you have certain constraints, but it is a very versatile tool. And the second issue uh, to consider, I know this is not something that you can do uh, overnight, is uh, keep in mind that um, review the data that you're collecting and the data, <clears throat> the data collection form that you're using and consider whether any of this data might be available from an upstream system and might be better collected there and have the analytics and the reporting from the upstream system like MedAccess or MSupply, rather than trying to put everything in DHIS2. I'm sure that the storekeepers are going to appreciate it. And at the end of the day for the public health system, you're still going to have all the data that you need and maybe even more data. Okay, so I will then, if there's no other questions, I'm, uh, yeah, I think we, have answered the question from Vahid. Yes, I'm just yeah. absolutely. So you, as a man, I think uh, uh, yeah, that was answered. So I will I will move on to the um, to the tracker program to so to the um, configuration of the of the real time uh, mode. Um, so sorry, I'm going to can, I can close these tabs. Um, so this is all native. Basically what we have done is when we first explored the possibility of create, building the real-time system in DHIS2, uh, we actually succeeded to be precise. It was Scott uh, Rospatrick, the analytics expert who built the first uh, uh, tracker program that was fully functional. Um, the, the problem was that that um, tracker program, native tracker program, required 10 clicks for every 
item that you would distribute. So you had to click down through a menu and you have seen now you have just one button scan and then enter the quantity. And instead of pressing one button for scanning, you had to press, uh, press 10 buttons every time. And that would not, not, not have been practical. So the customization is actually purely the user interface to have basically a one click um, um, uh, use. But the data model is completely built on, uh, on a very, very simple tracker program that is simpler than uh, probably many programs or most of the programs that you're using. So you have a, you have a tracker program um, with few settings. I'm just checking if there's, there's, no, there's nothing particular here. Um, and yes, so for the attributes, there's only the item code and the item description. Actually, you can see only the, in this case, the item description and the item code is used only in the background. So if you're wondering, PSM means pharmacy stock management. So in case you're also looking at this in the sandbox, this is what was built by Bow Systems. And this is the name of the application that is currently, uh, that has been rolled out actually in June. So you have only two attributes, very simple. Then you have the program stages. And basically you have a single program stage. So again, it's really very simple. It's repeatable, of course, because you have, you can enter um, uh, many, many transactions. And then the, the different fields that you have seen in the line listing, um, you have it here. So these are basically the tab that you have seen the stock distributed. That was the green tab on the mobile. Then you had to discard it that there was a red tab and then you have the correction. And then you have the possibility of receiving stocks. So you don't have this on the screen, but of course this is catered for. As I mentioned, uh, we will in the uh, native uh, DHIS2 module that we're planning for April, you will have the option to receive it manually, or you can do that through the web portal um, or it's through an integration. So you need this um, uh, data element, it is, and then you can, um, can also use uh, enter stock directly on the web portal for receiving. So if you want to play around, if you want to explore how it works and you want to add stock, you just need to go on this stage. Then the stock on hand. So this is calculated, so nothing entered, but of course you need to cater for that in the data model. So this is a field that will uh, include the program rules for the stock on hand. And then the deliver tool, uh, it's an option set. It's basically shown here for uh, data element used for technical reason. That's what you have seen, emergency room, inpatient, and so on. And then you have, um, then you have the, the previous stock balance that is needed for the program rules. That's a bit of a tricky uh, issue that I will not explain. So there's one question saying that uh, it's an event program. No, this is actually a tracker program. So you can see it is a tracker program, it would not work with an event because this is like repeatable um, stages. And then there's some um, okay, um, configuration. Here's a question. Okay, is it just background noise? I don't know if somebody went. And then you have the, yeah, okay. okay if, you can if you can please mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Okay, I thought somebody wanted to have, make a comment. Okay, then you have the, the usual um, uh, data entry form. So uh, I think that's all there is. Uh, when does it, uh, program state. Then you have the access, so you can, uh, you can uh, select which facilities have access. In this case, we have just given it to two facilities and then notifications, which is currently not under use. So that's in a nutshell, very, very simple. Two attributes, a one program stage with uh, these seven data elements. That's all that's needed. And if you're skilled, you can probably set this up in half an hour. So I don't know if there's any questions on this. Okay, otherwise I can show you on the, I will now intentionally use the um, the tracker um, tracker capture. I know that uh, you can also enter through the events, but anyway, if I 
entered through the event, it's going to refer me to the, to the tracker menu. So this is what it looks like on the web portal in case uh, you wanted to manage it or to view it. Uh, so you can again see these uh, 11 items here. You can see that the item code and the item description is separate. Is separate. Uh, while on the mobile device, you can see only the item description, but the this system is integrated with uh, Oracle ERP system, Enterprise Resource Planning System. So the code is what is linking the two systems uniquely together using the API uh, endpoints. So if I, um, so by the way, there is, this is, uh, maybe I should, sorry, I'm going to go back because I forgot to show you the program rules. I will not uh, explain them. I'm not sure that I actually understand them exactly. You have a program uh, rule variables that you need to configure and you have some program rules. It's written in the, um, in the user guide and the previous stock balance is needed for technical reasons. As I mentioned, you can't like overwrite, you can't have two data values in the field at, at the same time. So you need to temporarily store um, your previous stock on hand so you can do the calculation, but then you have the stock on hand calculation and you have this simple program rule. Um, so again, a single program rule um, for, so actually three program rules, but then in the program you have a single action that is actually very simple. Once you have worked it out, it's simple, but I was quite uh, nuts to crack on how to actually make this possible. So that's just to tell you that you have a tracker program and you need the program rule variables and the program rule, but intricate, but not very complicated. Let's say, put it like that. So here to mention, so if I take an item, like I have here the retinol, um, you have here um, the attributes, just item code description. And here you basically have a record of the different transactions. If you're playing around with it in the sandbox, I advise you not to, to actually not use these um, stages because uh, for a reason that I don't want to explain, it's related to the program rules. It's, it's quite tricky to work out the, uh, the correct functioning. But in any case, if you want to add stock uh, for, for experimenting, you can do that You just create a new uh, transaction and you enter stock received and it will add it to the item. So this is the basic way how you would add stock um, to your facility. So you could do that one by one or you could do it through the integration. But as mentioned, um, you can, uh, we plan to make this available uh, through the future bulk load application. In the meantime, I guess I installed it. You have the the BIF, the third party BAO systems import foundry application that was actually, um, that you can also use, uh, that we are actually using for our project. That's, kind of, that's uh, kind of essential because we cannot, otherwise we would, would have to enter um, for testing and so on, we would have to enter all of this one by one. So let me see programs. Um, Okay, I will not actually show it now. You have to like export the program and then create a template and then you, sorry, I'm here, right? And then you can um, in, fill data and then you can import it. But it takes a little, uh, bit of fiddling to, to work it out. It's actually, uh, okay. So I think, uh, let me check my notes list. I think that's what I wanted to show. Any questions? We have one uh, simple question, George, on the uh, mobile device for the uh, reporting. If the tabs can be shown uh, vertically and not horizontally, which, we, which may make it easier for mobile devices. Uh, sorry, on, on the reporting mode? Yeah. 
Uh, okay, I'm just wondering, I think the answer is no, but if you had the tabs vertically, um, I see you want the tabs on the left side vertically, and then when you open the tab, you still have a vertical table. Uh, as far as I know, this is not possible. Yeah, and also from our testing, we've been using also tablets. It's not necessarily a, a, a mobile phone that would be used, but maybe a tablet, and you would have a bit more space, and that may be less of an issue. And this is also something that's built in functionality of the of the app. So it's used for different purposes for health programs and the horizontal scrolling of the tabs. And I don't think that's come up as an issue in general. So I'm not sure that that would actually be a problem in implementation. You can hear from others that have used this uh, at scale with the use of the tab. So this is really about uh, maybe aesthetics and functionality uh, when it comes to the, to the user interface. Yeah, I mean, one thing to keep in mind about tabs, tabs are great, right? They allow to structure, but you have seen that I had quite a few and that scrolling um, you don't want to have too many tabs because scrolling left and right is not great. And you have seen also that uh, I have used actually abbreviations for the tabs because otherwise it would be long text, even more scrolling. I'm just wondering whether if you had the tabs like on the left side, it would take quite a lot of space. So it's always something to consider. You have seen that the descriptions are quite long. So you already have some scrolling to do in the table. So always keep in mind the, the usability. If you have another column on the left that is basically not used a lot, um, then you would have less space for the columns. But my suggestion is um, if you think that that is useful in principle for maybe other applications, then please do uh, open a JIRA ticket for the Android team to, to consider it, to assess it and to consider it for the roadmap. Right now, I have a question from somebody who's asking if there's a uh, if there's a demo instance where they can uh, play. And as I mentioned, and I put in the link again to the sandbox, and that's there. What I've also done for this transaction, the real time stock tool, so the transaction based tool, this prototype, it's first available in the root folder. So there's the APK file, which you can you can download and install on your Android device. It's in the root folder for the, uh, the with the Academy content. I just named it real-time stock prototype. So this is already connected to the same sandbox. You can log in with the same credentials that you see there, demo stock one, two, three exclamation. So you can use this and test this and see how it functions. And I repeat once again, this is a prototype. This is not how it will actually look once it's integrated and part of a, a, you know, native features within the DHS2 Capture app, this will be available from April 2023 release. What I've also done is if you go into the announcements channel in Slack, I put in a link to the Figma mockup, which will show how this workflow and the user interface will look once it's an integrated part of the Capture app. So this will be part of the regular download you will have the different workflows that are being demoed here, looking uh, and feeling like the, the regular DHS2 app. You will also have the in-app analytics. So this is the, uh, and even in the mock-up, you see the small analytics button at the bottom where you can go into the line listing app and have your digital uh, stock card showing transactions and so on. So this is will be the integrated solution. Right now we're showing this prototype. You can download it, test it, and at least see how the uh, the workflow is. All right. So that's for the real time stock. Um, I just wanted to to add because I have been cheating. You might have noticed that I've been showing the configuration in our sandbox development because, of course, Brennan and myself we're tinkering on this uh, every day. Um, but what I'm showing here, this is the I just logged into the sandbox, like Brennan said. I think he, he showed it. You know, I'm sure he showed it yesterday. Um, with the login, um, it's available globally. This is the actual sandbox. And here you have the full configuration of the, of the real-time mode. So if you're interested how it is set up and you want to play, if you want to receive stock, it's, uh, it's all available. You just George, need to print the button. Go ahead, Brennan. Yeah, now I have a question because you went through the configuration for the aggregate, so the report-based, and then you went through also for the real-time stock. 
Now, uh, particularly for the for the for the reporting, this is relatively straightforward. Uh, there's no uh, you know hocus pocus there. However, when you get to an actual implementation, you do have to manage the different data sets and the different items. Now, how how can that be done? The total number of items that would be available in a hospital or a clinic or down to a community health worker, how should that be done and how can that be managed? And also thinking of in the case of an integration, is there uh, how do we align that data with the ELMIS so that we're reporting on the same items? Can you just comment a bit on that? That there's actually some work to be done on harmonizing the data that we're using. George, you're on mute if you're speaking now. Yes, yes, thanks. Uh, so I didn't get that. Are you talking about the analytics or rather about how many, how to manage the catalog and the data items? The, data the catalog. Items? The catalog. Yeah. Okay, good point. So that's absolutely critical. And yeah, thanks for raising that because actually that was, um, <clears throat> that's actually one of the big benefits that is not obvious. You just see a mobile device and you think it's not a big deal, you have a list. Actually, this was one of the motivations of the, the Red Cross project uh, that I personally worked on like for three years, is that we have found that uh, all of the stocks and the orders, they were managed uh, exclusively with Excel. Some people were uh, tinkering with access databases and other tools, and it was uh, a frustration until the last day. So I spent 25 years, uh, you know, uh, every day almost correcting wrong item codes, wrong item descriptions, because of course you're free to enter anything into Excel. So the fact that you have a standardized catalog is already a huge benefit that you will then notice once you suddenly, you don't have any items to, um, to fix anymore. And you basically have a, a catalog that is shared by everyone. So the way this works, and this is kind of my daily bread for the implementation is that we have asked all the participating facilities to uh, provide us a list with their items. So as an example, the Red Cross has a catalog of 20,000 uh, items that they have in the database, not only medical, but all the other items. Um, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders, probably similar. UNICEF, they also have huge catalog. So you don't want to have all of these in your database unless they're actually used. So actually as a catalog, I should go to the data elements. That's a better way. So basically the data element in the maintenance, that's um, already your, um, that's basically your catalog. So here you have a list of all uh, all the items that are managed. Of course, you have also some items that are needed for the tracker program. But basically, this is a list of, uh, of all the items with the item descriptions. And um, the beauty of the system is that, uh, of course, the data elements can be edited, but you have the user rights. So I'm not shown that, but you have a very a highly developed, sophisticated user management menu. And all you need to do is to say, you assign the user right from managing the item catalog to certain uh, limited number of uh, administrators who can add and edit items. And then the, the user is only able, other users are only able to add or remove those items uh, from their data set. And then if occasionally you have a new item that has to be added, then you have to ask somebody to create the items. So for creating a new, let's say you have a new product or maybe you have um, uh, a drug product, but you have a new strength. So you're adding a pediatric dose, a pediatric strength um, to, an exist, uh, to an existing one. So you can either create a new data element or you could, uh, can clone a data element. Let's say if I have cloxacillin, tablets 250 and I want to uh, add the 500 milligrams, I can just edit here and um, create a new item with another description. They have to be unique. Uh, you always want to store zero values because of course you want to have be able to report your stockouts. That's basically it. So if you fill a name and then the HISP, they can advise on the best way to code 
to code these items if you want to use codes and uh, you, you add it to your list. The same if you want to deactivate, you can uh, remove items. So this is how you manage your catalog. And then once you have items added or removed here, then in the data set, so the stock item list that you're creating for your program, um, for the country or at the facility level, here you can just add and remove items. So this is kind of baked in, it's not obvious, but it's a fantastic um, a product catalog tool. And of course, if you're using, if you're integrated with a system like MedAccess M Supply, then you could envisage, uh, we have not uh, done that yet, but you can envisage that you will uh, synchronize your data catalog um, mm -hmm. between the two systems. So if you were to add an item to your national catalog, then it could be technically this is possible to actually add uh, MedAccess as demonstrated. You could uh, like push an item from MedAccess into DHS2, which could be part of the catalog. And the great thing about this is that you avoid mistakes because of course, if you're just sending a list to somebody and they're entering it manually, then you might have mistakes. So this is also the way the Oracle integration works that you have these catalogs that are synchronized. So you're absolutely sure for the first time that anybody who is ordering um, or who is reporting their stocks on DHIS2 is exclusively using item codes and descriptions which completely match the Oracle ERP system. Okay, there was another question on the package. Uh, I guess I can answer that again, Breno. Yeah, there was a question from Abdel asking about the demo. So, There's a package to download and that can be exported now from the demo site. I gave access to the import export tool. Okay, great. So just to reiterate that I mentioned that, uh, but I showed it only briefly on the slide that we are not ordering, offering a package. We were not planning to develop a package as such that you can download and upload the whole package into your system because we think that you will need to customize it anyway, especially the item list. Um, so this is unique. Every organization, every country, they have their unique uh, lists. You will have the um, Francophone countries uh, using French, by the way, uh, with the Red Cross. I haven't shown that, but actually um, that we have also provided the real time uh, system in, uh, in English, French, Spanish, Russian, so in Cyrillic and in Arabic, right to left. So you can use it in different languages. But anyway, that will have to be customized so that's not really worthwhile. Uh, of course, you could have a package where you like upload this tracker program for your stock management. Um, would save you a bit of time, but at the end of the day, uh, let's say as soon as you want to change the wording of your um, data elements and you don't, you want to call this expired and not discarded, you have to change it. So since it takes maybe one hour to set this up, you're probably better off to just um, develop it. But uh, as mentioned, you have the complete guide um, that will guide you even if you're not experienced in DHS to how to set this up. Data reporting in a low resource area, you don't store zero values. Okay. Um, so you will have to uh, you will have to store the zero values absolutely for logistics i understand that in an hms health management information system context this is different but if i go back to a data entry form of course for logistics it's absolutely critical because if you if you don't show the zero values and there is indeed a separate dhs2 setting for that then you will not know whether that stock was not reported or there a stock out occurred. So the only way of um, keeping an accurate record is by visualizing the, uh, the zeros. Now, whether you could somehow hide fields without a value is beyond my knowledge. Probably have to ask the HIST provider on that. I'm not sure. Yeah, George, that's a good question. And that's also yeah. a good technical question. But as you said, having the zero value is essential for uh, for logistics and uh, 
understanding the difference between a, a stock out, for example, versus a, a missing reported value. Um, we have only a bit of time left, George, only five minutes, but I have a question. I wondered, I was wondering if this maybe would have come up from one of the more DHS2 uh, expert participants, but um, if you're creating indicators with this data model proposed using data elements and category options, there would be a challenge in applying that indicator to many different uh, uh, products. How do we foresee that being managed? And that's a potential downside, but uh, how do we see that uh, being managed uh, in an implementation? Okay, so just to show an example. So here you have stock outs of this item. That's just, uh, sorry, here's a stock on hand. So here you have some stock outs for the Metro Needles all right in November. And this is of course for logistics, absolutely critical because it's also one of the main indicators uh, to monitor your stock outs. So concerning indicators, uh, I mean, the indicators you will have to way um, build the, um, the indicators. Um, let's say if you want to measure your stock coverage time, you have to build them one by one anyway, regardless of what data model you're using. Um, and there is this, uh, this PIF app that allows you to also upload and create uh, indicators, even predictors, right? So you can basically create um, a template for one indicator and then duplicate it across items if you have the UIDs and then upload that. Um, so this is, um, I guess you can also, uh, I suppose you can also like um, create new indicators with in the import, uh, with a metadata import export feature. So we are thinking of also um, uh, maybe in the future, if this is accepted, if there's enough request to have a kind of metadata cloning tool that would allow to uh, create several indicators. But for the time being, um, as native in DHS2, you have to create them one by one, but I do recommend looking at this tool. And just to add that, uh, so George and I, we have uh, the role of working then in the core team in the HISP Center here at the University of Oslo. We're taking also these requirements and these potential challenges and using DHS2 for LMIS. So for one, if you have any of these kinds of challenges or barriers that you see in implementing this, let us know and we can look at how we can find solutions and eventually raise this to the development team who would then build tools and, and solutions for, for having this as you know, uh, something adapted for DHS2 for future releases. Um, and then secondly, it's related also to the to what we said about not overusing the system. This is not something we would recommend for you to install in your central medical store, for example, and manage your warehouse. This is not what the system is made for. And these kinds of limitations show up. So when you see these limitations, connect with us and we can try to raise it and see how this could fit into the development roadmap. Um, yeah, maybe I just add to that because that's an excellent point. Uh, I know I'm sounding like a broken record, but um, you know the question is if you have a lot of indicators or predictors to calculate, um, as we said, it's possible. But uh, rather than um, you know spending a lot of time uh, or paying a lot of money on the configuration, consider what you actually need and try to simplify, because those calculations. Um, are certainly available in uh, natively in systems like professional systems like Medexis, uh, um, Oracle or, or M-Supply. So try to simplify it for the storekeeper. Uh, think of rather calculating everything upstream. That's kind of our philosophy, but still not depriving the storekeepers of, of dashboards if that is needed, uh, but basically considering uh, pushing them with, with a report as a, as a, presented briefly the Red Cross project that is currently being deployed in eight countries, uh, 40 facilities for now. We, we only collect the stock on hand and the stock distributed. We don't collect anything else and we don't have any calculations in DHS2 because everything is done either in the Oracle system or in that case the organization has a native uh, business intelligence application. So try to keep it as simple as possible. Thank you. George, we're at 44 minutes. We'll take a 15 minute break uh, in just one minute's time. Thank you so much for going through some of these details. Similar to some of the other presentations, we've gone through a lot of different content relatively quickly. However, the 
recording will be available on the YouTube channel, so please refer to it and use it as a guide. Also, uh, look into the documentation and the other resources which we've shared. And then, of course, connect with George, myself, and any others within either your teams. You have DHS2 experts in countries where it's implemented. So there's people that know the system even better than we do from a pure DHS2 configuration perspective. So engage with them, engage with the HIS partners, and there's a lot of different options for uh, you know, understanding and learning how this can be implemented. Um, We'll take then a break. We'll come back with then Craig and Gary, our friends from M Supply, who will have similar presentation to yesterday, showing what their system uh, can provide and how it can be used uh, potentially in tandem with DHS2. I'm sure there will be lots of interesting questions as there were yesterday, challenging questions about which decision to make and which way to go. So we'll be welcoming them in 15 minutes time. All right. So see you back here at the top of the hour. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the recording, Simona, once again. Um, so then today we've gone through quite a bit of stock uh, related content, uh, configuring stock reporting and the transaction based stock management in DHS2. A lot of considerations on how that's configured, considerations on implementation, analytics, integration, and so on. So I think that's great. I remind everybody that after this coming session now we'll have an open Q&A and experts lounge, as we normally call it in the academies and the, the DHS2 uh, uh, gatherings. So we'll be open for questions and to take up any other uh, uh, use cases you may have, or, or we'll just be available for you following that. But right now, I want to welcome our friends from M Supply. So Craig and Gary, who will be presenting um, their software, what it can provide, um, and then also answer some of your questions about uh, this integration approach and how we can foresee this working. Um, there's already been quite a lot of engagement, a lot of tough questions, so I'm sure uh, that they'll be uh, also sharing some of their expertise and experience uh, in this field as well. All right, so without further ado, Craig and Gary, the floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Thank you. Craig, over Thank to you. you. Thank you very much, Breno. Uh, thank you, everybody, for giving us the time in this uh, presentation. And uh, uh, we have, will maybe be a little bit provocative. And uh, Breno and George and us are, are good friends, so uh, we uh, we take do this in the spirit of trying to get everybody a really good solution. So we also uh, very much welcome questions. So don't uh, you can put them in the chat on Slack, and Gary will keep an eye on them there, or um, you're welcome to interject and maybe bring up or notice people putting their hands up, etc. Okay, I'll uh, share my screen and let's see how we go here. Uh, Bruno, we've got 45 minutes, is that right? Yep, and then we're followed by 15 minutes Q&A, but so you can go a bit over as we'll have also the Academy, uh, oh, sorry, uh -huh. the uh, Q&A, so not so strict yeah. on the 45. Okay, so the, the after the Q&A is the Academy as a separate session. Cool. Yeah, we can okay. take we can add 15 minutes also for specifically for Medexis. That's fine. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's see. If, hopefully you can uh, see a screen there. Yep, that's perfect. Okay, so uh, we've uh, got uh, uh, three separate demonstrations, or four if you include our dashboard, and uh, a few slides in between. So um, we'll just give you a little bit of background and then some demos and uh, then we'll be uh, I think that'll pretty much take the 45 minutes so this is us around the world we've been going since uh, 2001 uh, this year we moved all our work into the M Supply Foundation uh, which is a registered not-for-profit and uh, the motivation there is uh, to be explicit about our aims and uh, that uh, to try and make it make an organization that can do as much good as possible in the areas that we particularly uh, feel we've got something to, something to contribute. So our staff uh, mainly based in New Zealand and Nepal, a smaller team in Cote d'Ivoire who are francophone, and uh, we have uh, also Portuguese and Spanish speakers on our team. So uh, we think we've got uh, uh, quite a few of the working languages covered and. Uh, yeah. 
So, so as I mentioned, transition to a not-for-profit trust. Uh, part of our, our work very much at the moment is about uh, converting M Supply over to uh, a new modern open source solution. And uh, we're also migrating all our all our various tools. We had a separate mobile and a desktop application. Uh, one of the things we're very proud of is that we've been able to re-engineer that as a single code base that spans web and desktop and mobile all in the one application. And we'll show you that a bit later. And of course, along with the opportunity to rewrite something, you can get a chance to not only make it look a bit nicer, but uh, uh, address some of the issues that uh, have always existed in, in uh, the current desktop M supply. So we would contend, uh, hopefully not too controversially, that uh, M supply is the only vertically integrated system that can take you right from uh, quantification, running tenders and contract management, uh, through to running your central warehouse, through to a simpler solution at district store level, and right down to uh, using our mobile application to do uh, 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 provide services at uh, service delivery points that are patient facing. Included there, uh, two countries used M Supply for their COVID vaccinations. Uh, we include a vaccine dispensing module as well as uh, prescription dispensing. Uh, we have busy hospitals using M Supply that dispense over 2,000 prescriptions a day. So, um, over eight hours, that works out of like one every 15 seconds. So very large multi-user systems. And so uh, we think it's quite unique to have something that can scale from a single tablet right up to uh, those kinds of super busy hospital dispensaries. Uh, we have also developed a cold chain app that uh, uh, we have WHO PQS uh, certification for. And uh, it's integrated both um, uh, as a separate application and also into M Supply Mobile. So uh, we'll show you a little bit more about that shortly. And lastly, uh, we have uh, used uh, either uh, Grafana or Superset to open source dashboard tools to enable you to visualize all your data from M Supply at any time. So uh, if we were to say one thing that uh, makes M Supply special is uh, is that it really is offline first. So uh, we know DHIS2 Tracker is is the same now, and uh, we have had several countries uh, where we've installed M Supply. Uh, for example, Laos and Myanmar, and uh, where uh, they have thought that their internet was good enough. They've installed it and it's failed dismally. They've changed over to our offline first solution using synchronization. And uh, those two countries have now adopted M Supply as their national system for LMIS. So uh, synchronization has often saved us. So just to explain what that means, um, it, first, it operates both in our mobile app and also in our desktop app. So uh, this little diagram shows the situation with uh, when the, the, the green tick in the middle saying the internet's on and uh, everybody's working away and data is synchronizing between facilities every few minutes. So it's pretty much like having a live national system with everybody on the same, you, your dashboards update with everybody's stock immediately. Then the internet breaks and what happens here is that even the multi-user systems can carry on working independently, everybody does their work. And when the internet comes back, whether that's in five minutes or five days, then the the queue of synchronized records gets cleared and everything catches up. So um, we know there's a an age coming where there's a, a high-speed satellite internet available everywhere, but the internet also goes down for different reasons, such as a rat chews through a cable or somebody forgets to pay the internet bill. So we still think synchronization is an important safety feature, at least for the next decade. Right, M Supply and DHIS2. So two, two kinds of uh, two models that um, we'd like to talk about. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, the one that we have experience with in production. 
which is uh, where DHIS2 is performing its traditional role as a health information system. And uh, mSupply collects data from all the facilities, all the LMAS data, and then on a schedule from our cloud server to DHIS2's cloud server, usually. Uh, for a, for a particular country, then uh, the data gets sent across. So uh, that's that's been used for several years now in Lao, and uh, Timo Leste have just set that up this year. Uh, very good reliability. Uh, setup's relatively easy. Uh, you obviously, uh, when you're talking about a, an organizational unit or a particular data element, which usually represents uh, some. Uh, value for an item like the item stock on hand or its uh, average monthly consumption you've both got to be talking about the same using the same ids so there's a bit of work to set that up but uh, that's a one-off and uh, M supply has something called universal drug codes which um, uh, provide you with a, a an immutable code for each each generic item in M supply uh, that's uh, so it makes it a lot easier. Okay, so the second model that uh, you're, you're spending a week discussing uh, at the moment uh, is where uh, M-Supply just operates at the warehouse level and uh, at the facility level, you're using DHIS2 for your logistics. So um, uh, yeah, can we make this work? Yes, and uh, last year we... Uh, uh, Breno and George set up a, um, a seminar and uh, where we, we we made a proof of concept application showing this working. So um, there's a few more challenges to doing it this way. Um, it means that there's, a, compared to using M-Supply, there's more manual entry, we think. Um, our understanding is that DHIS2 tracker is single user. So... Um, if the facility expands out uh, beyond what you can manage with a sing single uh, Android application, uh, I'm not sure if you could split out different DHIS2 functions onto different Android um, hardware devices at a facility. I think that might be possible, but otherwise uh, you do have that challenge of, of the single device. Whereas mSupply, even with our Android application, uh, with Open M Supply now, it's possible to build multi-user Android applications at the facility level. And uh, lastly, there's challenges around item coding. So um, um, the setup's the same, but obviously, if you're if you're running a system that's trying to track every item at a facility, any time you add a new new item to your catalog, uh, you need to then uh, think about how you make a system to make sure that uh, it's correctly added to both systems before any any synchronization attempts are made or any communication attempts. So, at the moment, uh, the side this kind of system isn't used anywhere that we know of. Uh, reliability should be okay. We th we think it can be made to work. Um, we think there'll be some challenges with ease of use, as we mentioned. Single single user on an Android device, which is often a phone. Uh, I think you'll have challenges once you get to transactional data handling, the kind of volumes of data that uh, come through even quite small stores. And uh, as we mentioned, also what we call horizontal scalability, ability to go multi-user will be a bit of a challenge. So uh, this is uh, just a... Uh, matrix which uh, has got far, many too, far too many things on it but uh, giving you some idea of um, uh, if you look at the columns we're saying these these are the different kinds of uh, the rows are different areas um, that uh, are needed within a health system uh, different areas of functionality and um, and uh, PIR being patient immunization record I think I've got the acronym wrong there and EMR being elect electronic medical record. So um, in our ideal world, uh, we we would uh, have M Supply taking care of most of these things. I think in DHIS2's ideal world, 
the, oopsie, excuse me, we'll go back a slide. Let's get rid of this. Uh, where DHIS2 would be taking care of uh, most, most of the things. Um, and over on the right, we've got uh, what is typically in place in uh, many of many of the countries we work at, especially uh, in Africa, where Sage has been used um, for warehouse logistics. DHIS2 has been used for national HIS, and often for lower level logistics, there's um, some version of open LMA, LMIS that has usually been forked and made specific to the country. So effectively a bespoke system. Um, and so uh, what we are trying to show here is there's actually a lot of different ways you can configure this. And um, we're not at all suggesting that um, uh, uh, you should do one way or the other, but um, it's, uh, we think that there's a lot of potential to mix and match to get the, the kind of um, solution that's right for your country. So then the question would be, how do you choose? So uh, um, we'd suggest that uh, that's a combination of saying, what have, what have we already got installed? Where are we at now? We would be like to be in say 10 years from now. Uh, we think that's a reasonable time frame to be working towards. Then you need to think about any special requirements you've got. For example, if it must work offline, that will take out a lot of a lot of possible other systems apart from DHIS2 and MSWay. And uh, then you need to make a plan for how you're going to cross that gap, how to get. And our suggestion is uh, do it in small stages and uh, continually think about scalability. So um, we sort of think of. Um, um, a scalability is being able to handle large volumes. Um, uh, vertically, vertically scaling is it can it can it handle the whole uh, uh, spread of your health system from top to bottom, and thirdly, horizontally as an as facilities uh, become busier and busier as you as hopefully your country as health services is able to provide more and more for more and more services. Can that facility, can the system at the facility level scale to be multi-user? Right, that's a lot of talking from me. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, at this point, we'll swap the screen share over to Gary and uh, he's going to give you a demo of existing MSPY. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Craig. Okay, so in the greatest tradition of um, software demos we're going to risk it and do it live uh, okay hopefully you should be able to see my screen now yeah we see that answer fine out here yeah great thank you so I, I'll give you a quick run through everybody uh, of, of what this is the existing M supply the, the the current one that's out there Craig's going to cover the open M supply the one that's coming soon um, after me. Uh, but yeah, what you're looking at there is the navigator just showing you, um, you know, this is where you access all the functions that you would access generally every day. And there's a number of tabs across the top here with handling all the different parts of the system. First one that it opens in is the customer tab, uh, which is in M Supply, the customers are the people that you give stock to. So this is effectively all the goods outwards here. So you can create a, a customer invoice uh, or we can see a list of the customer invoices. And this is the ones where you've, you've distributed stock to different places. So these are your customers here, list of all the invoices and the total amounts that you've sent. Uh, requisitions here. This is where obviously your customers have ordered from you. Either you've entered those manually or they've entered them themselves in their own facility, and then they've been transferred to you through the synchronization system that Craig was talking about. So we'll have a look at, at one of these in a, in a bit more detail. Just have a look at this one here that has been previously processed. Um, so you can see a list of items here. It shows the stock on hand that, that you've got in your store here in, a, in the supplying store. This is the customer's stock on hand, how much they asked for, what you've already given them, 
So you can see that we've already supplied everything they asked for, and therefore the remaining to supply is zero. And then, of course, if you're going to send some more, you can actually you can choose uh, what to put in here and then send it to them by creating a customer invoice. Um, obviously, this one's been uh, processed before, so we there's nothing to process here. Okay, so they're the where the facilities have ordered from a supplying store. On the other, the next tab, the suppliers, these are the ones that supply stuff to you. So this is all about goods inwards. Craig mentioned that um, um, supply can do tendering. So there's the tenders here where you can uh, put, you can construct a tender with all the conditions and then send them out to, uh, to selected suppliers um, automatically or manually. Um, you can see here, we click on that, we can see a list of them. If I double click on one, these have all been uh, created before. You can just see there's a, a few items being included in this particular tender. There are some with some quantities. Um, I think there will be some, yeah, there are some suppliers assigned and there's, and there's some of them, they've even bid on uh, the different items. So you can go ahead and then um, choose which bid you want to, or who, which suppliers bid you want to give the order two for each one uh, for each item when you've finished all of that obviously you don't have to use tendering but if you do it will automatically create purchase orders for you you can create those manually yourself as well um, you can do calculated ones where M supply takes your consumption uh, historical consumption or some other factors some other forecasting information that you put into the system to generate an order for you um, if you're going to order, or you can just create a blank one, create one yourself. Another helpful screen is to show you what's outstanding in your pipeline, what you're waiting to receive. Um, so you see these are all red, which means they've they've passed their, their expected delivery date. And that's because the data in here is old. Um, okay. So the next thing to do after you've ordered all the goods then is to receive the goods from your supplier. So you can create goods receipt notes. Um, in here, we can see a list of those here. There's a couple waiting to be processed, one that's already been processed here. You can see that we've received a couple of items in different batches and expiry dates. Um, so this stock has all expired when it was received in, from when it was received in. And Hopefully it's been distributed and hasn't sat on the shelf till it's expired. And then finally, you would finish the process off by entering a supplier invoice, which is all about the financial side, prices and things like that, whereas the goods receipt is about where you're going to put it in your warehouse, the location, if you're using locations. Um, so the next tab across the top, that was all the goods receipt side. Across the top, then you've got your basic stock management functions here where you can do adjustments if you find something wrong with your stock that somehow doesn't match what has been entered into M supply, somebody made a mistake, or you can do a stock take where you, you can create count sheets. Here's one that was created earlier on, but it's just got a, a list of all the stock that you want to um, do a stock take on. I think this is probably all the stock take in the warehouse. Um, and then you have a snapshot quantity which is what you've told M Supply you have in stock and what in the current stock in the system. And then this is the quantity that's actually been counted. So you can edit these in here. You can also print sheets out to, uh, to give to users to go and count in the warehouse. And then you can come and put any changes to the batch and the expiry date uh, that you find or the pack size as well and the, the quantities that are mismatched. You can correct them all here. And then when you create the inventory adjustments, M supply will make your stock match exactly what you've counted on, on the sheets here. The other tab of, of interest here would be the reports tab. Um, obviously, putting all this information is all very well and good, but it's no use if you can't do anything with it. So there are hundreds of reports built into M supply here and you can make uh, custom ones as well very simply. Lots of these options here uh, also contain many, many um, different type, different reports here. This is um, 
just showing us a lot of transaction based reports. Obviously, they are all about stock movements in and out and adjustments. So you would expect there to be a lot of a lot of reports there. So you can get all the information out. Um, the other two tabs are mainly for admin uh, and um, yeah, tasks like that. The assets functionality is here, um, but for managing currencies and all those kind of things, there's also a cash register. Um, if you need that, usually used in dispensary stores and things like that. Um, yeah, and the other admin tab here for a log, everything's logged underneath and the users as well. Let me just show you the preferences. We're talking about DHIS2. So down the bottom here is a DHIS2 tab in the, in the preferences where you can set up the connection to your database. There is another section in MSupply where you actually set up all the org units and the data elements uh, to connect them to your instance of um, DHIS2. Um, that's not here, it's in another part of the system. All right, so um, just briefly, I'm I'm only logged in. I'll just show you a quick cycle uh, in mSupply and ordering so you get an idea of how, how it can work in, in your context. You can see I'm logged into the general warehouse here, which is the, the basically the national warehouse. Um, if I now switch to one of the customers, I'll move to one of the customer's store. Um, I'll just go to one of the, let's go to dispensary. It's Hogwarts dispensary. When I log in there, you can see that the, the navigator's changed slightly. It is a dispensary, so the customers tab has become a patients tab. I do still have access to the customer-based functionality if I need to send stuff to other stores or to other external customers, but I now have prescriptions and things like that here. But here is normally as a, I would normally want to order from my supplier, say. Um, so if I go to the suppliers tab, I can create an order here where I would um, just create an order and I'll order from the general store in here, in the general warehouse. I'll add a load of items from a master list here that's already been set up. So these are all added for me. Now, normally uh, there would be average consumption data for all of these items. I don't have any data in this data file, so it's not, it's just showing zeros. So it means that there's no um, calculated suggested quantity. Um, here, I can just order the quantity that users actually requested, um, and then I can decide how much I'm actually going to give them. So I'll just, I'll just order two, two items here, the first two in the list. This shows them their stock on hand that they have in their store. Um, and once I'm ready and I want to send it to the to my supplier in the system, I can just finalize it and click OK. So there it is in the list. It's finalized and that's gone off to the general warehouse now. So if I go back to the to the general warehouse, we'll see in the requisitions list obviously on my customers tab in the supplying store, I'll see my new uh, order here. You can see there's one here that was processed previously back in 2018. Um, so this one is from today and here's the two items that I ordered. So here it shows the stock on hand that you've got in your store here in, your, in the general store, so the supplying store. This is what uh, the Hogwarts dispensary has. So this is what the customer has in store, how much they're currently using every month, how much they've asked for. Uh, so how much I'm remaining, you know, I haven't given them any yet. So it's all of the remaining to supply. And now I decide how much I'm going to give them. Um, I can just enter what I want to give them. And then I can, once I've done that, I can add any comments I want them to see here, but then I can create the customer invoice and send it to them. So yes, that's, yes, I want to create it. Um, I haven't actually checked to see if I've got any stock in here. Um, I do have stock, that's handy. How about that? A live demonstration that works even when I haven't tried it beforehand. That's gotta be a first. So now obviously as my supplier, I need to send that back uh, to the customer, back to the Hogwarts dispensary up here. You can see the name of the customer. I'll just confirm it and finalize it. Okay, and I'm done. So now if I go back 
from the general warehouse. When I switch back to the Hogwarts dispensary, we'll see that a supplier invoice has turned up in their store. From the general warehouse, here it is with those two items on. So all I need to do is check that this matches what I've received. And when it has, I just need to take it off hold and make any adjustments here that I need uh, to match exactly what was delivered. Click OK, and it's received into stock. All right, so that shows you a brief um, cycle all the way through. Obviously, there's some you can finesse that a bit. You can have program-based requisitions and all that kind of thing. Um, but that's a, showing you a basic cycle and how it would work on the ground uh, in a distributed system within a country. Um, something else I'll just briefly show you here while I'm speaking is the cold chain side of M Supply. There is I haven't um, shown it uh, connected to M Supply here, but here's a. Um, this is just showing you the screen of a device that sat on my desk. There are three sensors in the house, um, just measuring temperature. Um, and they're all, uh, this is the trace of the temperature over the morning. Um, and you can see that, that it's been fairly static. It's not particularly warm in my house. Um, but if we, if you click on one, you can actually see here, click on this arrow. Oh, I have to do it on the tablet or not. Oh, great. It's frozen. Let me see if I can get that back. We've had a full day of live demos, uh, so we're, we're perfectly fine, Gary. This is looking really great. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know why it's not showing or refreshing. Okay, hold on, let me just quit this. Make it play again. Okay, there it is. Okay, it's now showing you what's on my screen. So that's where I'd clicked this this one here to see the actual readings so here's a list of all the readings uh, there's an alert here because they're actually showing a breach obviously they're too warm for a fridge um, but I can I can download or email these to me or to somebody else if I need to um, so that's the the traces I can go and investigate each one of those I have a, just a quick look at the settings you can see how you can set them up the temperature breach settings are set here so you've got a hot breach and a cold breach, and you've got cumulative hot and cold as well. And you can set the times and the temperatures for those. Uh, I could have set them at different values so that they wouldn't breach. Um, but you get to see um, on the graph, you get to see the nice uh, breach settings. And if I connected them to M Supply, I would also get notifications here. If anything, um, if any breach occurs, obviously it would be connected to the stock. I would know exactly which stock it had affected, um, and I would be able to decide what I do with that stock, and I would be able to go and investigate. Um, so yeah, you can see the sensors here. I've got three sensors set up. And just a quick look at the settings for those. So you can blink it to go and see where the sensor is, and you can give it a name, and you can change the log interval as well. I've just made it a very short one. Um, so you get lots of readings and it looks like a pretty graph. All right. Um, so this is this is uh, the standalone uh, version of the cold chain, which would link to desktop M Supply. M Supply Mobile has this functionality all built into it. Um, so you would see, so you'd have the alerts again and the vaccine module, all that kind of stuff would be linked into all the, the cold chain. Um, and you get a full readout locally and on your dashboards nationally of, of all the breaches and, and the state of your, you know, your cold chain and, and what the equipment's doing and how it's going. Okay, I think that's, that's me done. Uh, Craig, back over to you. How about that? Am I unmuted now? We hear you now, Craig. Yeah, great. Sorry about that. 
Right, I'll just get back to sharing my screen. <laughs> and just to uh, We see presentation mode, but not full screen. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Don't worry. Close enough. Let's just leave it there for now. Uh, so, just to reinforce, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, just to reinforce uh, that M Supply Cold Chain actually gives you four different levels of alerting, which we think is quite unique. So, the first one is on the Android tablet itself which you could put uh, somewhere in your warehouse, uh, close to your cool rooms or your fridges. Um, if you need more than one cold chain app in, uh, in your warehouse, uh, you can have as many as you like. Each one can support six sensors on, on the screen. And uh, so it's very easy to build quite a, quite a large system or just for MSupply Mobile, just to have a single sensor for your one fridge in a small facility. So from the cold chain app, it uses Wi-Fi to send uh, the sensor data to mSupply Desktop. So uh, the alert you see over on the right-hand side is an mSupply Desktop alert telling you uh, that there's been a breach. So uh, this is moving it from uh, uh, to uh, bringing the alerts to where people are actually working. And we think this is really valuable as opposed to relying on somebody going once a day and checking has there been a breach. And from mSupply Desktop, it's now inside our synchronization system. So it synchronizes up to the central server and the alerts get shown on the mSupply dashboard. And we are also able to send alerts from our dashboard app, uh, either via email or via uh, com common messaging app, such as Telegram. So uh, that provides a lot of security it provides a national overview of your cold chain status. Right, thank you very much. Uh, okay, on to open M supply. So uh, uh, we have had funding to do open M supply for uh, two and a half years now. Uh, just as COVID was starting, we uh, we received funding from the Australian government, and uh, the first year was uh, spent. Uh, building some other things that were needed like mSupply cold chain, but also doing research. Um, we end up uh, uh, starting with a, a basically a blank slate, a, a totally new system uh, using uh, for our server side, a programming language called Rust. And uh, for uh, the, the uh, user interface side using TypeScript. So uh, it's a little bit of a, an unusual choice. And uh, but uh, the Rust is gaining a lot of um, adherence these days and has been used widely by the likes of Amazon and Google for their cloud services because of its reliability and speed. So uh, it can handle very large workloads. Um, so, uh, and secondly, it, uh, uh, one thing that's not often mentioned is it actually also enables very low energy computing. So, uh, uh, they estimate that uh, a, a Rust application uses 70 times less electricity than a Python application to do the same job. So uh, it's also enabled us because it's uh, got fantastic cross-platform support to build a sim single application that uh, runs on an Android device or on a on a local desktop or in a cloud server. So um, the um, uh, we're quite thrilled about that, and uh, it means that we'll maintain feature parity between our mobile application and our desktop application from this point onwards, which will be great. And lastly, uh, one of one of the advantages is, is that uh, uh, it's uh, a more complicated language to use, but the result is you get uh, programs that are much, much safer. So uh, we uh, continually see... Uh, vulnerabilities on the internet due to caused due to memory leaks in programs or buffer overflows. These kinds of things just aren't possible to do using the Rust programming language. So technical background. Let me give you a quick look at uh, how it actually looks. 
Okay, so I'm using I'm just using uh, Rust uh, with a demo server. Sorry, I've named Supply with a demo server here. Uh, so from a web browser, uh, the application works exactly the same uh, on Windows, Mac, Linux, and Android. So we'll just log in here. <laughs> so, um, um, to start off with, let's go back to the dashboard. So, as you can see, a much more modern look. Um, uh, here we are in English, but uh, we've so far uh, tried to keep the French and the English versions up to date. Uh, so let's see how this looks. How to swap languages on the fly. It's not too bad. Change back into French. So um, um, the other interesting thing uh, we'll just show you briefly here is that we support right to left languages, uh, including fully flipping the screen, screen and the graphics around. So. Uh, if we go back to here, uh, everything is flipped around for uh, languages such as Arabic. It's a bit harder to get back out of there than to... Um, so... Uh, so starting with the dashboard, uh, you can see there's a lot of white space here because we'll be filling this in over the next uh, couple of years as we uh, get small widgets that are useful put on the dashboard. So uh, what we're trying to do here is prevent, present users with two things. Uh, one is what work do I have to do today? Uh, what things are pending for me to action? And secondly, uh, are there any uh, actionable uh, metrics that I should be looking at, such as uh, items with no stock, items with less than three months of stock, these kinds of things. So I guess an even more a better metric than that would be items with less than three months of stock that have not been ordered. So uh, these are the kinds of things we'll be working on. So uh, just to let's drop down the bottom here. Um, how are we going for time, Bruno? Five minutes to go. We'll go quickly. So uh, you can go a few minutes over. Like I said, we'll have the Q&A. So if you go a few minutes over, it's fine. OK, thank you. So a much uh, cleaner interface and uh, uh, so, uh, uh, much the same functionality that's an open supply at the moment. Uh, uh, sorry, in traditional supply, open supply is currently a subset, and we're slowly adding in features as uh, we get funding and as uh, our priorities change. As uh, different countries start to want to implement open supply and tell us what they need. So. Uh, We've also changed our language. You'll see that we don't talk about customers in the same way, but uh, uh, and suppliers as much as um, uh, trying to align our language with industry best practice, where we normally talk about distribution and replenishment. So uh, if people are used to SAP and this kind of bigger system, you'll be used to this language. So uh, I'll just show you briefly. Um, so I need to be in the right store. Um, replenishment, internal orders. So this is when you're ordering from another store. And we've just created one here. And I just thought I'd show you that uh, um, uh, you're getting a lot more graphical information. So this is when you're going to place an order to another store. It's showing you your average monthly consumption over the last few months. Uh, and uh, this isn't much use because uh, if we put in a number here, we might. Um, uh, uh, showing uh, there's no consumption, so it's showing that your stock won't change, but uh, uh, giving you a, a forward projection of what your stock levels will be if you order a certain quantity. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. et cetera. Okay, so uh, M Supply has the uh, the same idea as um, as oh, sorry, Open M Supply has the same concept as M Supply of having multiple virtual stores. So down the bottom here, you've got a store picker. 
where you can swap between different stores in your same facility. And we find uh, uh, this is useful again and again, because as much as we'd like all systems to be integrated, many countries run vertical programs where their vaccine stock is separate to their other stock or their TB medicine stock is separate. So virtual stores allow you to run on a single device, manage uh, your vaccine stock, your TB stock, and your general stock off, off, all uh, within the one system. So uh, that's what that's the way that uh, virtual stores are used, even down at the lower level of them. Right. So um, the other thing I will just briefly show you is that um, uh, this is. Uh, uh, the work we're doing at the moment for Global Fund for Use in Papua New Guinea, where they have built um, bespoke modules for uh, HIV and TB management, and they've asked those to incorporate uh, that uh, patient management and counter management back into open supply. So this is where most of our efforts are going at the moment, because they want to start using this early 2023. So uh, most of our work's going here. So. Um, uh, We've actually learned a lot from the way DHIS2 works. And um, if we look at a, a, a patient here, you'll see that uh, uh, there's a lot of information here. And this form is built with what's called a, a JSON schema, which allows you to modify uh, what information you collect about each patient on the fly. And not on the fly, but uh, in each um, each program or each country can modify this information without having to resort back to M supply developers to change things. So that gives you a lot of flexibility to design quite complex systems the way you want. So um, these are, uh, uh, and the other, uh, the other interesting thing for um, uh, this uh, new new feature set in open M supply is that you have a full version history of every edit of every patient and exactly who changed what. So uh, you end up with a very uh, very detailed history um, uh, and a full audit trail of every change to your system. And this data synchronizes back to a central server. So uh, you've got a very robust uh, and uh, finely grained uh, record of, of what's going on and uh, that helps very much with uh, accountability but also helping with user training and to explain to people how to use the system better. Uh, let's see if we can look at a care encounter here and you'll see there's a lot of different uh, areas to here where uh, including for example uh, body weight history for this patient looking back at old uh, encounter records and uh, Things like this uh, very easy to have multi multi select uh, values in uh, when you in your drop down list because etc. Right, and lastly, we just uh, leave open M supply there for now and uh, have a quick look at uh, our dashboard. So, uh, when synchronization is running, all the data from Every facility, every transaction ends up on the M Supply Central server and is then uh, put into a Postgres database with, that's kept up to date every minute. So that uh, then allows you to use any reporting tool you like that supports Postgres. And uh, that's just about every reporting tool. Uh, currently, we recommend one called Grafana. And this is just an example of a Grafana dashboard. So uh, we just look at a different item. Look at paracetamol. And you can see down here the stock, the stock levels changed, showing you the months of stock in each store available. So some have got none, some have got far too much. And our dashboard is also able to uh, be used for things like showing uh, which items are expiring, uh, the value of expiring stock off into the future, and is also able to be used for cold chain data. So here from around the country showing you a number of breaches and uh, uh, because M supply cold chain data is linked to item locations it can, it can not just tell you there's been a breach but it can tell you uh, what stock has been affected by that breach and uh, the value of that stock and what you should do with it and even track those batches.
Right, I think we're just about at the end of our, we've covered the HIV TV modules. Uh, just showing you there for open MSPI, we do have a, a roadmap. We're at this point here. Next thing off, next cab off the rank for us is integrating MSPI cold chain into open MSPI. And uh, DHIS2 is not quite true because uh, Open MSupply still uses the same MSupply central server at the moment. So in fact, you can use Open MSupply with DHIS2 at the moment and it will work. So uh, what we're talking about there is uh, building uh, more, more finely grained integration into DHIS2 with Open MSupply, but uh, it will work as of today. So uh, I won't dwell too much there. I think we've covered those points. Uh, we've got uh, uh, the Australian Ambulance Service with the first users of OpenM Supply, and they were extremely positive about the experience, and they've been using it for four or five months now, and uh, it's been very reliable. We haven't had uh, any significant issues with that. Uh, me and Murray are expecting to uh, to start implementing OpenM Supply from the next quarter. Um, they were thrilled. One thing was very interesting was uh, that. Uh, they made a point that when staff are transferred from one facility to another, they won't need retraining because uh, they've got that common experience across mobile and desktop. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate you taking the time to listen. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Craig and Gary. That was really impressive, uh, everything you presented. Um, and I think it was good that you uh, went a bit over because I think you answered some of the questions that uh, that we had as well. I just have one comment because I want to make sure that the participants here get, get a chance to ask you questions. Um, I do have a lot of questions myself, but I'll hold this for the, the session immediately after. Um, but the comment is that, um, I mean, you said you would be provocative, but I think we agreed with pretty much everything you presented and everything you said. Uh, the comment is on the... Uh, you showed the one slide on how to choose, and even the slide before that with the different potential uh, architectures. Um, and I think there uh, you mentioned the DHIS2 ideal implementation, and I think that's the only point really to make, and it connects to the question from Kulse in the chat now about uh, uh, competing last mile solutions in DHIS2 and M-Supply. We had a similar comment yesterday when Medexa CLMIS presented, and there's a lot of uh, overlap. And I think that's what we're trying to get at here. And I can make the comment that part of the reason why George and myself are working in the DHS2 core team is to kind of guide the engagement of DHS2 implementations, the usage, and how it can best fill an existing gap within this field. DHS2 had been used for stock data for you know 10 years before we joined the team. It had been configured in different ways and used at different levels. And what we've tried to come with is, is a best practice and also to sort of uh, come with this recommendation as we had in the Mentimeter this morning saying we should not consider DHS2 as an end-to-end -end solution. Uh, and then the next step to that is of course, the, the how, how do you choose? And I think you had the perfect questions there and uh, considering the existing capacity of the different systems, where you're at and also where you're trying to go that will give you an indication of what you should choose. For places like you mentioned Timor-Leste, if you're having uh, already your stock data collected using M-Supply mobile at facilities, there's no real reason to consider or uh, uh, assess why you should use DHS2 for last mile logistics if that data is already there. What we're looking at, and I think one of the key use cases is where the data is available in DHS2. Is there a potential value added for the country considering sustainability and considering also the, the total cost of implementing a new solution? If that data is available at facility, would it be more beneficial to connect that with a central tool like M-Supply with all of its amazing features? So that's the only real comment from my side, and we can expand more on that, but there's no I think ideal implementation, it's rather looking at what is the reality in each country, conducting this mm -hmm. assessment, and then seeing what is the best realistically achievable option that also takes into account sustainability and all of these other aspects that uh, influence a successful implementation, not only the technical capacity, not just checking off the box of, you know, temperature monitoring or stock management and so on. But I'll stop there. I want to make sure that the participants 
get to ask questions. And I know, Gary, you've answered quite a few. I don't know if you want to comment um, on some of the questions you've already answered in the chat. But uh, uh, Craig, you as well, if you wanted to, to have a counter comment, please go ahead and I'll see if there's any questions from participants here. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, no, I agree with what you say. I, I think yeah, there's there's more than right, one right way to do something, uh, and success or failure uh, is really about your your holistic approach. That uh, you need to look at your your training capacity and your infrastructure and uh, your management commitment and uh, and uh, your uh, staff capability. All these things uh, are just as important as which system you choose. Actually, I'm seeing that all the uh, questions were answered by Gary, and we just took up the one question orally here from uh, Kosi. Um, I actually had one additional comment on the technical side that the latest version of the Android Capture app, so the Android uh, DHS2 app, you have the option to, uh, to have multiple users and up to uh, three different instances. So that's a new feature that came in the latest release. So just a, a small clarification there. I don't know. Craig, if you've seen or tried the, the, the latest version of that mobile app. So there's this multi-user support. I don't know if maybe you're referring to some other feature that is not covered by that, but I think uh, that was a point I had. Thank you. No, that that was, uh, I didn't know about that. So that's uh, that's valuable. Um, I'll look forward to finding out more. Yeah. And George, I'm you, sorry, Bruno. George, you have your hand raised. Do you want to say something? Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, I mean, just to concur with uh, what Breno said, I also um, had this reflex when I saw like the ideal uh, DHS2 world. So I don't absolutely don't see it. We're not like, um, you know, um, having a tally or anything. Um, I think, uh, I mean, we are an uh, open source uh, platform. Uh, the ambition is really to provide, um, to connecting the first data mile. And personally, I'm happy for anybody who achieves that with whatever tool. And we can see that the gaps are so huge. I mean, there's very few countries who can claim that they have an end-to-end -end, uh, system from the facility or even the patient up to the national system. So there's so much work to do. And uh, I mean, if, it, if there are several systems and we can achieve that in 20 years, that's great. So there's really no... Um, my opinion, no room for, for competition. It should be rather cooperation because it's really a global, I think it should be one of the sustainable development goals to connect the, uh, all facilities uh, logistically um, upstream. Um, and uh, I hope that this will be like a global effort and maybe in 10 years, maybe 20 years, uh, it can be achieved together. Thank you. Sounds good. All right, I think um, I don't want to uh, to go over time and I actually have quite a few more points in the questions for uh, for the M supply team. So what I'll do is just I'll do a quick recap and close off for today and then we can just those who want to stay and continue as part of the conversation and Craig and Gary you're, you're more than welcome we hope you guys can join us that you just stay on but I just will do a quick recap of today that we presented then the uh, stock reporting uh, configuration, the demo and configuration of that, and also the transaction-based tool, a tool based on tracker, and how that can be used both standalone and as part of an integrated solution. Um, we really went into the technical aspects and um, the recording, as I said, will be available after the um, after the uh, uh, later in the day today. So there's no uh, PowerPoint slides. It was really live demos, as you saw George going through all of the different uh, workflows and the different configurations. Use that as a reference and also come back to us if you have any more questions or comments. The sandbox, so the demo site, which I've shared multiple times, uh, it's there. I made the import export tool available and confirm with one of uh, the participants here now, I think it was Jamal, that you could export the metadata from there. And we'll also share some configuration uh, uh, documents for that. Uh, if you need any more help or um, uh, uh, guidance, please let us know in the chat. The uh, prototype of the transaction-based tool is also available in the Google Drive, so you can download that and connect to the same server using the same login credentials. 
Uh, and uh, as I said, the final version integrated will be part of the April 2023 release, but you can see a prototype of that on the Figma site, which also I've included in the announcements channel in, on Slack. All right. So that's a quick recap of what we went through today. The content will be there. Um, and we thank then the M Supply team for presenting their tool. Really impressive with all the features and also all the work that they've done to move to uh, open M Supply. And uh, uh, we're very keen to, to follow along on their journey. Um, the approach is again, not dogmatic. Uh, it's really open to whatever solution works. We'll applaud you and you know we'll support you. There's more than one way to solve these solutions and there's more than enough work to be done. So we're very happy to see that they're um, you know, succeeding and on this path. I think there's quite a few things that we may want to engage with you beyond the LMIS. I see that with the engagements with uh, Papua New Guinea, with the patient records, also with your open source experience, I think uh, uh, Craig and Gary it would be interesting to connect with you and some of the other uh, members of the DHS2 team uh, and maybe have a talk and maybe see how we can learn from each other and different experiences. So big thank you again to you guys. Um, so thank you to everybody. Word of the day for your attendance is bubble wrap. So use that and we'll welcome you back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Oslo time. All right. Thank you. And those who want to continue, just stay online.